Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Honourable members, I respectfully acknowledge that we are sitting today on the land of Aboriginal people and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I thank them as First Australians for their careful custodianship of the land over countless generations. We are very fortunate in this country to have two of the world's oldest continuing living cultures in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose lands, winds and waters we all now share. Are there any matters of privilege? Honourable members, I wish to advise that we will be visited in the gallery this morning by students and teachers from Fig Tree Pocket State School in the electorate of Maywa, Bray Park State School in the electorate of Pine Rivers, and Mudraba State School in the electorate of Mudraba. Are there any appointments to be announced? Will the clerk read the list of petitions lodged? The following lodged e-petition sponsored by the clerk is now closed and presented. 2,755 petitioners requesting the House to reject the two-lane bypass proposal for Tyro and instead support the construction of a four-lane highway as part of the Bruce Highway Tyro flood immunity upgrade. Notifications and tablings. I call the clerk. I inform the House of the tabling of certain papers in accordance with the notification and tabling of papers document emailed to members. Are there any ministerial papers? Are there any ministerial notices of motion? Are there any ministerial statements? I call the Honourable the Premier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In terms of our daily COVID update, I can confirm that we have six new cases, but all are required overseas and are in hotel quarantine. We have 26 active cases. And in good news, we've had 9,593 tests in the past 24 hours. This is a terrific result, but I remind everyone, if you are sick, please stay at home and get tested. And in another record, we have had 14,054 vaccines given in the past 24 hours. So that's steadily increasing, and that's uh, great to see. Uh, Mr Speaker, new cases appearing in the community in New South Wales and Victoria show why we can never let our guard down when it comes to the pandemic. Queensland enjoys more freedom than most places in the world, but the price of this freedom is eternal vigilance. Mr Speaker, I will never stop keeping Queenslanders safe. The Health Minister will have more detail in a moment, but our strong advice is for people to reconsider travel to Greater Sydney at this particular point in time. Health authorities have published a list of exposure sites from the latest cases. New South Wales has ordered those who have been at those exposure sites to quarantine for 14 days, so they should not be travelling to Queensland. In line with other jurisdictions, we will maintain our restrictions on travel from Greater Melbourne for another seven days. Mr Speaker, in order to better protect Queensland, I can announce all travellers to the state will require a new Queensland travel declaration. From 1am Saturday, June 19, travellers arriving in Queensland will have to complete this online declaration that will make the job of contact tracing so much easier. Yeah. Those living in border communities are, of course, exempt. Mr Speaker, this week's budget shows how our strong health response is enabling our economy and our way of life to continue through this pandemic. We can't give up on this fight. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this week's state budget delivers for all Queenslanders, no matter where they live or, or, or what they do for a living. Supporting farmers to rebuild and recover is at the core of our COVID economic recovery plan. I'm proud to say that the $523 million agriculture budget delivered by the Treasurer this week will help thousands of primary producers throughout Queensland to build back better. Yeah. And, I, and I absolutely thank the Agriculture Minister. He's doing a great job. Yeah. Farmer uh, Premier, uh, Member for Southern Downs, uh, welcome back. You're warned under standing orders. <laughs> An extra $3.3 million for rural economic development grants. The first three rounds of this program created 1,800 jobs, and this investment is tipped to create an additional 600 jobs in regional Queensland. $42.5 million over four years to continue much-needed reforms of Queensland's fisheries sector. 
ongoing funding for five offices in Bundaberg, Mackay, the Central Highlands, Bowen and Mariba to work with industry to address labour shortages. That's another really important yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more than $71 million to roll out an improved and expanded drought assistance program. Yeah, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker, currently farmers have to wait for, for a drought to receive government assistance, which on average has been about $7,700. Thanks to the investment delivered in this week's budget, for the first time in history, producers will be able to access up to $50,000 to help drought-proof their properties. Yeah. Mr yeah. Speaker, last sitting I updated the House on the success of our cluster fencing policy. To date, we've invested more than $60 million in grants and loans to build 9,000 kilometres of cluster fencing. That's roughly the same distance. This has resulted in a 75 per cent increase in lambing rates. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Brisbane to Longridge, Longridge to Brisbane, Brisbane to Longridge, Brisbane to Brisbane. It just keeps going. Enough. There's so much to We haven't enough time. That's right. Mr Speaker. I can, oh, just, I keep, I can <laughs> just keep talking about what we're doing for the farmers yeah. and our agricultural yeah. centre. Yeah. I love talking about what the Labor government is doing to assist our farmers. So I'll, I'll come back to you a lot later on. <laughs> Mr Speaker, today I can confirm that we're investing an extra $4 million to deliver the Regional Agricultural Development Scheme. This will give producers access to grants to support infrastructure that will grow the sheep industry and create more jobs in the bush. This week's state budget will deliver for farmers right across Queensland. But don't take it from me, Mr Speaker. Let's hear what AgForce has to say, shall we? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The state government's 2021 budget announcement is a win for Queensland farmers. Oh, yeah, yeah. AgForce has welcomed news that the, that the powers that will be that the powers that will be develop a suite of programs for drought affected producers as well as helping communities prepare for future droughts. Yeah, yeah, Mr yeah, Speaker, yeah. this budget is the third year in a row that my government has delivered over half a billion dollars for agriculture and it dwarfs the budgets delivered by the Newman Nichols government. Yeah, yeah. I'm proud to lead how to get that in there, member for Clayfield. Well you're still here, so it's fair, uh, it's fair tr game, you're still Premier here. Premier will come through the chair. Sorry. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I'm proud to lead a Labor government that is delivering the funding our agriculture sector needs to build back better here in Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, this evening the member for Bundaberg, along with the member for Burnett, are hosting a Bundaberg promotion night here at Parliament House. Yeah. Bundy nights. <laughs> Bloody nights are always the best nights, and I know there'll be some great produce and information on show from producers. Sorry? I've got nothing else to do, has he? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Order! Oh. Welcome back. Order. What is this name? Order. Order. Order, members. Anyway. Premier has the call. Bundaberg Rum, Kalkai Moon Distillery, Bundaberg Cane Growers, Bundaberg Sugar, Ballistic Beer Company, Queensland Bee Keepers Association, Tinnerberries, and the Bundaberg Fruit and Vegetable Growers, who I know have received one of our digital transformation grants as part of our economic recovery plan. There will also be business and community organisations and tourism industry reps like Bundaberg and North Burnett Tourism, Monropo Conservation Park, Lady Elliot Island Eco Resort and Splitters Farm, which we gave $1 million from our Growing Tourism Infrastructure Fund for campsites and eco-tents, hoping to attract 66,000 people a year. And I encourage members to go along if they can. Mr Speaker, the 2021-22 Budget as part of our economic recovery plan will directly support the Wide Bay region. There's $883 million investment in infrastructure supporting 3,200 jobs. Nearly $725 million is being spent on health, a $32.6 million budget increase on last year. Full time health jobs are also increasing by 85 in the region alone. $35 million in funding on education to improve and upgrade skills for Bundaberg specifically. Nearly $1 million to uh, Wangara State School to provide wastewater and water service. More than $5 million for construction projects to improve facilities at the current Bundaberg Hospital. The budget also includes $15 million to acquire the preferred land site for a new Bundaberg Hospital. I know the 
the member for Bundaberg and I have been to that site. It's a great site. We're committed to delivering this new hospital and the planning is well underway. $1.6 million towards a new $3.4 million agricultural and horticultural centre at Bundaberg TAFE. Funding to support the rehabilitation of the Burnett River Bridge and culverts near Bundaberg Central. Funding, there's so much happening. Oh Funding on improving environment and tourism, cultural centre improvements for Monropo. We've also purchased, and the good news is that those opposite just have to listen. Yeah. We have also purchased an additional 42 hectares of land to double the size of the conservation park and investing $750,000 to install more than 400 new solar panels, meaning it will run almost entirely on re renewable energy. Yeah. And funding also in the budget through our Great Barrier Reef Resort Rejuvenation Fund to support renewable energy infrastructure on Lady Elliot Island to help the resort to operate 100 per cent from solar energy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Queensland is also good to go in tourism, Mr Speaker. That's the message we've shared to millions of tourists over the past 12 months in one of the most aggressive tourism marketing campaigns Australia has ever seen. Today I'm proud to confirm our hard work is paying off. I can announce that our Good To Go tourism campaign has injected more than $7 billion into our economy over the last year. Isn't that wonderful news? Supporting 207,000 jobs and generating more than 42 million room night bookings across the state. Mr Speaker, in total, this campaign has helped to lure more than 7 million unique visitors to the new Queensland.com website, driving more than 800,000 leads direct to Queensland businesses. This is an outstanding result. It means that our Good To Go campaign is now one of the most successful tourism campaigns ever delivered in Queensland's history. But that's not all we're doing, Mr Speaker. Tourism is an important part of our COVID-19 economic recovery plan. That's why we've worked hard to secure more major events that stimulate our economy and support jobs, including the 2020 AFL Grand Final at the Gabba, the entire WNBL season, Townsville's blockbuster State of Origin opener last week, the Mets European Masterpiece ex Exhibition, yeah. the Nitro yeah. World Games, the TV Week Logie Awards, and now, of course, we're going for gold with the Olympic Games. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, commitments in this week's budget take us to more than $860 million in support for the industry to build back better. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, every Queenslander has a right to be safe and a right to feel safe. Yeah. That's why we will do all we can to improve community safety. I can confirm today that the police minister is drafting laws to change the way parole for offenders who have committed certain crimes is treated. Yeah. Under the changes being developed, child killers serving a life sentence and multiple murderers serving a life sentence can be prevented from applying for parole, keeping them behind bars for longer and shielding the families of victims from further trauma. Order. Mr Speaker, these changes are about keeping the worst of the worst behind bars for longer. They are aimed at keeping the Queensland community safe and those who have committed the most evil of crimes in custody for longer. This is what the community has asked for and this is what we will deliver. Here. They also tip the balance in favour of keeping these offenders locked up longer by creating a presumption against parole for these offenders. They are aimed at ensuring victims and their loved ones do not need to experience the trauma of parole being considered every 12 months. Mr Speaker, the Police Minister will have more to say about this matter shortly, but what I can say is that we will always do what we can to keep Queenslanders safe. Here. So I call the Minister for Police and Corrective Services. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this government will always do all in its power to support community safety. We have a proven track record of introducing the nation's strongest laws to protect the community. And now we will do that again. The Palaszczuk government will introduce the toughest parole laws in the nation so that a person convicted of killing a child and serving a life sentence, or a person convicted of multiple murders and serving a life sentence, can be blocked from obtaining parole keeping them behind bars for longer and sparing the families of victims from further trauma. Yeah. Under these proposed laws, the President of the Parole Board Queensland will be able to make a declaration that a person who is convicted of killing a child and serving a life sentence or convicted of multiple murders and serving a life sentence and eligible for parole will be blocked from obtaining parole for a period of up to 10 years. Further, there is no limit on the number of declarations that can be issued to these prisoners, which means that a further declaration could be issued for up to 10 years 
at the expiry of the previous declaration and so on for decades. Also, the President of the Parole Board Queensland will be able to make this declaration irrespective of whether the prisoner has already made an application for parole. Understandably, whenever a prisoner applies for parole, this can re-traumatise the families, friends and the community. These new laws are aimed at shielding those who have lost loved ones from unnecessary pain and suffering. To be clear, the government is introducing these changes because it is committed to ensuring the safety of every member of the community and to protecting the families, friends and the community from unnecessary trauma. In addition, even if a declaration is not made by the President of the Parole Board Queensland, a new presumption against parole will also be introduced for the prisoners who fall into this cohort. This means these prisoners who, as the Premier said, and I agree with her, are the worst of the worst, will have to prove that they do not pose a threat to the community before they are even considered eligible for parole. These proposed new laws will set a new benchmark for the nation. No other jurisdiction in Australia has the power to declare no parole consideration for a period of up to 10 years and with the potential of further periods of up to 10 years. And no other jurisdiction targets both child killers serving a life sentence and multiple murderers serving a life sentence in this way. These proposed laws will be the strongest in the nation to support community safety. And, Speaker, I can't emphasise this enough. The extent to which these laws, these proposed new laws, are aimed at reducing the level of trauma experienced by the families and victims of violent crimes. The tough new laws we are proposing are about protecting the victims' families and protecting the community. I call the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our state's strong health response to the COVID-19 pandemic meant that the 700 workers on the giant $3.6 billion Queens Wharf Brisbane never missed a beat. In fact, we were able to speed up construction last year during the height of the pandemic. We are one of the only places in the world who are able to keep their construction industries going largely unaffected throughout the pandemic, keeping Queenslanders in jobs and preventing delays. That means we are now about 80 weeks away from Queens Wharf opening late next year. The first section of the Queens Wharf Neville Bonner pedestrian bridge was positioned at South Bank yesterday, ready to cross the river and connect to the Brisbane CBD. The Riverside Expressway will close this weekend and a 40 metre, 43 tonne section of the bridge will be craned into place at the city end. It's transformative infrastructure like Queen's Wharf and Cross River Rail that will change the face of South East Queensland. This will greatly increase pedestrian connectivity in our great city. Mr Speaker, 50 years ago last Friday, in this very house, Neville Thomas Bonner was chosen to fill a casual Senate vacancy, making him the first Indigenous Australian to sit in the Australian Parliament. Yeah. Seeing the Neville Bonner Bridge go into place is a great acknowledgement of his legacy. Yeah. In recent weeks, another Queen's Wharf record was broken, with a tenth tower crane going up on site, the most number of tower cranes for a single project site in the nation. And it's technically 11 cranes if you include the one in the river on a barge working on the Neville Bonner Bridge. 20 years ago, there were 29 tower cranes up in Brisbane, and Premier Beattie then was pretty chuffed about that. Today, according to the uh, Ryder Levitt Bucknell's latest count, there are 71 cranes up in Brisbane as part of 120 cranes across Brisbane, the Sunshine Coast, Townsville, Cairns and the Gold Coast. By this time next year, more than 1,500 workers will be on site at Queen's Wharf as it readies to welcome an estimated 1.4 million annual visitors. It is another Palaszczuk government-backed project that is creating jobs and accelerating Queensland's plan for economic recovery. I call the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. 
Speaker, the budget I delivered on Tuesday forecasts a return to surplus for the Queensland economy within the forward estimates. But it's important to reflect on the vital role that our stimulus spending has played to protect our economy and to drive the recovery we see underway. In 2020, the Palaszczuk Labor government made the calculated decision to put the budget into deficit to defend the lives, the livelihoods and the businesses of Queensland. As improving revenues in this week's budget show, in 2020-21, our deficit is projected to be $3.8 billion, a staggering decrease of $4.8 billion from what had been forecast in December last year, a $9.6 billion deficit. But through the depths of the pandemic, all revenue lines fell, in many cases, to zero. The Office of, or Queensland Revenue Office started pumping payroll tax refunds out the door to help tens of thousands of Queensland businesses and hundreds of thousands of Queensland jobs. With revenues so low, that meant we borrowed to pay operational costs. We borrowed to pay the wages of frontline workers. And we did not resile from that speaker for one second. Speaker, just this week I have heard the argument that borrowing should only ever be for capital and never for operating expenses. Speaker, if we had gone down that path, if we had not gone into deficit, tens of thousands of nurses, police and other frontline staff would have lost their jobs in order to bring expenses down to match revenue. Speaker, put simply, that would have been a catastrophe for the Queensland economy. But more importantly, Speaker, it would have been a personal catastrophe for thousands of Queenslanders and their families. Unemployment queues would have been lengthened. Spending in our economy from those no longer employed would have been stopped from such savage cuts. And it would have decimated our ability to deliver the COVID-19 health response that has put us where we are today. Speaker, in fact, during this period of deficit spending, overall government worker numbers continued to increase. This was the right thing to do and consistent with the approach taken by the Morrison coalition government and other OECD countries. While our stimulus measures had a temporary impact on our bottom line, they did not damage our state's credit ratings. In fact, our ratings have remained stable, while New South Wales and Victoria have been downgraded. Today, SNP Global says Queensland has the strongest credit rating of any Australian state. The approach the Palaszczuk Labor government has taken through the current financial year and the one prior is in contrast to the last time the government went into deficit. Speaker, in 2012-13, total public sector employment decreased significantly and SNP Global put Queensland on negative outlook. As has been noted by ratings agencies, from financial year 2021-22, Queensland's budget is forecast to have a cash surplus from operating expenses. Because our economic recovery plan is working, the cash revenue the government collects will exceed our cash expenses. That means we won't need to borrow to pay wages. And we will, of course, continue to borrow for capital investment, delivering our $50 billion infrastructure guarantee to deliver the roads, the schools and the hospitals and, most important of all, the jobs that Queenslanders need. I call the Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations and Minister for Racing. Thank you, Speaker. The 21-22 education budget is delivering for regional Queensland, with over $310 million worth of job-generating projects to maintain, improve and upgrade schools and support local jobs across the state as part of Queensland's economic recovery plan. Speaker, in the far north, that means $51.2 million for projects including the new $11.5 million classroom building at Melanda State High in Hill. And I look forward to opening that building with the member for Hill. $2.4 million for new classrooms and amenities at Lockhart State School and the electorate of Cook. And I also look forward to opening those amenities with the member for Cook and a new $11.5 million hall at Trinity Bay State High. In North Queensland, there's $37.3 million going to help deliver new training facilities 
at Tharangawa State High and at Home Hill State High. We're pumping $26.8 million in infrastructure spending into the Mackay Whit Sunday that's going to deliver new classrooms, such as more than $8 million at Mackay Northern Beaches State High and $3.8 million at Proserpine State High. And I look forward to opening those with the member for Whit Sunday. In central Queensland, there's $74.6 million for projects like new classrooms at Yupoon State High in Keppel and for stage two of the Calliope State High School built by this Labor government on land those opposite were going to sell. In Wide Bay, $35 million will deliver new classrooms at Harvey Bay State High and on the Darling Downs, $67.7 million is going to be pumped into schools from Toowoomba to St George. With St George High getting upgrades to the school hall and new $8.8 million, I have got so much I don't even know where I've got enough time, $8 million training facilities and at Warwick a new $5.8 million school hall. Also in the West, there's funds for the big red truck training facilities at Longridge State High and at Cloncurry State School. Speaker, across the state, we are also ensuring every state school student has access to a wellbeing professional, namely at our regional centres for learning and wellbeing in Roma, Mount Isa, Atherton and Emerald. We're expanding remote kindy with 20 more schools coming on board in 2022 in parts of the state with no nearby kindergarten services, such as in Gregory and Southern Downs. Our homework centres will be shortly rolled out in schools across the state and, Speaker, including more than half of those in regional Queensland. Speaker, our regional education infrastructure spend is an investment in local jobs and, importantly, an investment in Queensland's children and students, no matter where they live in this great state. I call the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Queensland has smashed its vaccine record, with many of our recently announced community-based vaccination locations up and running. Yesterday, we were able to administer more than 14,000 vaccinations. Here, here. I want to extend my immense gratitude to all of the health workers who are working at our vaccine locations across the state and the hard-working Queensland health staff at the Vaccine Command Centre. I'd also like to thank all of the Queenslanders who are stepping up and getting vaccinated. Here, here. After news of a positive case in New South Wales uh, community uh New South Wales community broke yesterday. The Palaszczuk government has followed the advice of the Chief Health Officer and taken decisive action to protect Queensland from COVID-19 virus. Importantly, Mr Speaker, any person who has been to an identified New South Wales exposure site and is currently in Queensland should go and get tested and then immediately return to their home or accommodation via private transport to quarantine. They should contact 134 COVID and complete Queensland Health's online contact tracing form and await further advice. Individuals who have been to a New South Wales exposure site and are planning to travel to Queensland should cancel their plans immediately. As anyone arriving from, uh, from interstate into Queensland from 1am tomorrow who have been to an exposure site will be required to go into hotel quarantine for 14 days. And I can advise that the uh, New South Wales website is now reporting 15 close contact sites from Bondi Junction to Mascot, North Ride, Redfern and Barcluse and Zedland as well. And also another uh, casual contact site and now they have listed public transport route as well. So we please ask anyone who's been in New South Wales to check the website and check it regularly for any updates. Mr Speaker, we need to be vigilant. Since 11th of June, we have had 493 flights from Sydney arrive in Queensland. We have 72 expected to arrive today. We cannot let our guard down. Given the increasing number of exposure sites being published by New South Wales Health, the Chief Health Officer has also advised that any Queenslanders who plan on travelling to Sydney should reconsider their travel. Mr Speaker, I was pleased to hear that the Victorian Government has somewhat eased its internal restrictions, particularly those in Greater Melbourne. This is great news for the people of Victoria. However, there are restrictions that remain in place for the people of Greater Melbourne. I have been advised by the Chief Health Officer that at this stage it would not be appropriate to roll back the current travel restrictions that we have in place for the Greater Melbourne region. 
The Victorian government has indicated they'll consider whether to ease the remaining restrictions they have in place for Greater Melbourne in the near future. We will review the restrictions we have in place for Greater Melbourne at that time. Mr Speaker, today I can now announce some exciting news. The Palaszczuk government is taking an additional step to maintain the safety of Queenslanders whilst also ensuring that we can return to normal as soon as possible. Earlier this morning, the Queensland government website went live with Queensland's new travel declaration pass. Yeah. Any person travelling to Queensland, whether they're a Queensland resident or not, from interstate or New Zealand must complete the online Queensland travel declaration within three days of travelling to Queensland. This system will apply to any travellers arriving into Queensland from 1am this Saturday, the 19th of June. The declaration system operates in a similar fashion to the Victorian system. Depending on the location that an individual is travelling from, they will be issued with either a green or amber pass permitting them to travel to Queensland. A green pass indicates the individual has not been to any COVID hotspot and can travel freely into the state. An amber pass will be issued in the circumstances that someone is travelling to Queensland and has been to an interstate exposure site and applies particular quarantine conditions on the person when they arrive. Declared hotspots will be red zones and no travel to Queensland will be permitted from those locations. I want to make it clear that this system will not be imposed upon border communities who often engage in cross-border travel in their daily lives. These cross-border communities are clearly identified on the travel declaration pass. However, where a declared COVID exposure site is identified in a cross-border LGA, there may be a requirement for those residents to complete the travel declaration for a short period of time. Of course, anyone living in those communities who have travelled to other parts of another jurisdiction that has exposure sites or a hotspot um, should also declare that. The Queensland Travel Declaration will be extremely useful in ensuring that when interstate exposure sites are declared, that we can swiftly contact arrivals from that state, which includes Queensland residents, that we know are in Queensland to provide them with the most up-to-date and accurate public health messaging. This is the way the Palaszczuk government is continuing to keep Queenslanders safe. I call the Minister for Environment and the Great Barrier Reef, Minister for Science and Youth Affairs. Speaker, Queensland's environment is a major cornerstone of the Palaszczuk government's latest budget with a record $1.4 billion investment to protect the country's immense biodiversity and create jobs. This year's record investment will see a significant focus on the ongoing protection of the reef, measures to reduce landfill, land regeneration, conservation while creating jobs as part of the state's COVID-19 economic recovery plan. We know that to protect the environment, we must drive down emissions and create jobs of the future, which is what this budget does. This investment in the environment, together with record investment in this budget for renewable energy, will help Queensland to meet its emission reduction targets. The budget confirms another $270 million for our Great Barrier Reef to build on the $400 million already invested by the Palaszczuk government since 2015. The reef funding will go towards programs aimed at improving the water quality of this World Heritage listed area and the $6 billion economy and 60,000 jobs that rely on it. The budget invests more in the Land Restoration Fund, with a further $60 million to be made available for the investment by the program, which partners with farmers and other landholders for the restoration and carbon farming. That injection for the Land Restoration Fund also includes seed funding to co-invest in even more projects with businesses and farmers through a new Queensland Natural Capital Fund. To support our job creation and tourism industry, we'll also invest an additional $8.6 million in our national parks for better infrastructure, visitor experiences and to employ more First Nations rangers. Yeah. A further quarter of a billion dollars from the Department of Environment and Science will be aimed squarely at waste. We've banned a number of single-use plastics, seen more than four billion containers recycled through our popular Containers for Change program, and now we're putting our sights on capturing and recycling waste through resource recovery before it gets to landfill. As part of the government's commitment to conserve wildlife in the Sunshine State, six million dollars will be provided over four years to bolster the South East Queensland Wildlife Hospital network, with a further $1.5 million per annum ongoing. I'm also proud to announce that we've locked in $3.7 million for the next four years and more than $900,000 per annum ongoing to support koala conservation projects. Yeah. Speaker, this budget also focuses on building Queensland's scientific capacity, with a further $7.7 .7 million over three years for research into disaster management, water quality monitoring and sediment management. 
Our scientific and health experts helped keep Queenslanders safe during the COVID-19 pandemic, allowing us to kickstart an economy recovery focused on jobs. We're backing them with close to $8 million in additional funding to support the 300 plus scientists who work tirelessly in the pursuit of scientific excellence. We'll also continue to our, uh, with our commitment to build on heritage in Queensland with an increased funding of $5.5 million over two years for works at Newstead House. We went to the election with a plan for economic recovery and a strong platform to protect our environment and create jobs. And we're backing Queenslanders by delivering a strong budget that will protect our reef, regenerate land and create more jobs in more industries. I call the Minister for Children and Youth Justice and Minister for Multicultural Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two of the most important jobs of any government is protecting the community and keeping vulnerable children safe. As the Minister for Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs, I am acutely aware of the enormity of these tasks and the significant role safe Queensland communities play in our COVID-19 economic recovery plan. That is why this year's budget will continue to focus on programs and services to keep children safe and to keep the community safe, and that means boosting our frontline services where needed. This financial year, we will spend a record $1.55 billion on the delivery of child protection services to keep children safe from abuse and neglect. We will recruit an extra 154 frontline child safety workers over the next two years. Sadly, following the pandemic, we are facing increasing pressure and demand in the child protection system. That's why we're providing an additional $282.6 million over two years for out-of-home care to give children a safe roof over their heads and support to help them thrive. Mr Speaker, safety is at the heart of all our funding decisions. In Youth Justice, my department's budget includes a total of more than $290 million for Youth Justice Services to reduce offending and reoffending. This includes continued investment in the diversionary and intensive out-of-hours programs that work and increased funding to intensify these in areas that need them most. We know Queenslanders want young people to be law-abiding and have opportunities and a future. We also know Queenslanders want programs that get at-risk young people back into education, into training and into jobs. That's why we're tackling the causes, not just the symptoms. Our investment includes an extra $92 million over four years to fund practical actions to deal with repeat offenders and continue programs and services to tackle youth offending. This means the fantastic work of our co-responder teams of police and youth justice workers will continue in eight locations, including Townsville, Cairns and across South East Queensland. It means the fantastic work of our services, such as our, as I mentioned, co-responder teams, but also the Transition to Success program and the trial of on-country programs in Townsville, Mount Isa and Cairns will continue. The package will also fund extended hours of supervision and extra youth workers on weekends and at night to intensively monitor high-risk repeat offenders and deliver intensive support to their families. But this budget isn't just about continued investment in initiatives that work. It's also about looking forward, continuing systemic reform and addressing the criminogenic factors that lead to offending to keep our communities safe. Mr Speaker, we are partnering with the Ted Knoffs Foundation to establish a new 10-bed drug and alcohol three-month residential treatment facility and program for young people who have or are at risk of offending through funding of $7.7 .7 million over four years. To complement our substantial legislative reforms this year, we will invest $5 million to establish a short-term remand centre. Mr Speaker, earlier this year, our new 32-bed West Morton Youth Detention Centre opened which complements the extra 12 beds at Cleveland Youth Detention Centre and 32 beds at Brisbane Youth Detention Centre delivered under our government. This budget, we've allocated $5.7 million to start the next stage of planning, to undertake a business case to investigate options for additional long-term detention centre capacity. These moves underscore our commitment to keeping Queenslanders safe from that small cohort of repeat offenders. Unlike those opposite, we invest and we plan and build for the future because community safety is paramount and community confidence essential in our youth justice system. I call the Minister for Employment and Small Business, the Minister for Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, wherever you are in Queensland, you deserve the chance to get a good job. Members will already know that we're committing $140 million to our successful back-to-work program, 
which has already helped over 25,000 Queenslanders into work and helped nearly 12,000 businesses across our state. Yeah, yeah. We fund these job-creating initiatives not only because they provide really important career opportunities to Queenslanders, but because they help small businesses and over 80 per cent of employers benefiting from back to work are small businesses. They help small businesses find the right staff. And we know at the moment, Speaker, that finding staff and the right staff uh, is a critical issue for businesses. But I have even more exciting news to share with members this morning, Speaker. The Back to Work program is not only being funded but revitalised based on feedback from the thousands of businesses I spoke to on our Small Business Roadshow. The Palaszczuk government is always striving to make things better. We listened to what small businesses had to say about how we could improve Back to Work and we've acted. Yeah. The new program will provide wraparound support to employers and disadvantaged job seekers. That support will not only help businesses recruit workers, but vitally to retain them as well. We've added more elements to the program, mentoring sessions, training guidance, support to secure possible employment requirements like a driving licence or a blue card. We're making sure both job seekers and businesses have what they need to succeed. The focus will be on those job seekers who experience significant disadvantage in the labour market who often need more intensive support to find a job. There will be payments of $15,000 to eligible businesses who employ an eligible job seeker, including the long-term unemployed, an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person or someone with a disability. And there will be a $20,000 youth boost payment for eligible businesses to employ an eligible Queenslander under 25. We are unashamedly focused on getting our young people in the regions into jobs. Yeah, yeah. The focus will be on those job seekers who experience significant disadvantage in the labour market, who often require more intensive support to find a job. Yeah. Speaker, the government is committed to creating genuine long-term employment outcomes because we know getting a job can change a life. It changed Sharon's life, for instance. Back to work helped her get a Certificate three in education support, and now she's working as a teacher aide in Mackay, a job that works for her and for her young family too. And I know the member for Mackay just loves hearing stories like that about her community. She said, Sharon said that never would have happened without the support of the Back to Work program. The new program starts on 1 July and will continue to play an important role helping businesses reopen, rebuild and get growing again. Tackling youth and long-term unemployment remains a focus of the revitalised Back to Work program because real recovery doesn't leave anyone behind. I call the Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen and Minister for Public Works and Procurement. Thank you, Speaker. The Palaszczuk government has a strong record of delivering cheaper and cleaner energy to Queensland households and businesses, particularly in regional areas where Queenslanders saw a 43 per cent increase in power prices under the LNP. In contrast, our record stands clear. Power prices down 22 per cent, the lowest speaker they have been in a decade, a direct result, a direct result of the decisions and investment by this government, assisting households and creating jobs. And under this Labor government, the trend is heading down further, with the Australian Energy Market Commission's most recent forecast indicating a further 14 per cent reduction over the next three years. And, Speaker, regional Queensland will benefit once again. I can confirm today that the Queensland Competition Authority has released its final price determination, with households in regional Queensland in communities like Mareeba, Charleville, Emerald, Biloela to save an average of $101, a 7.3 per cent saving in electricity this year. And small businesses too, Mr Speaker, will pocket an extra $79. That's cheaper electricity driving our state's economic recovery. Now, there is support for regional farmers and manufacturers to grow jobs and boost our economic recovery too. Speaker, in the days following the 2020 election, the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union raised the issue of regional businesses who will be moving off tariffs made obsolete in 2012. While the majority of the affected business consumers have found savings, there are a small number of uh, those whose annual power bills are impacted. Unions, industry groups like Queensland Cotton, Cane Growers, Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Australian Foundry Institute told us their member businesses needed help to support job security and economic growth for regional Queensland. So today, Speaker, I can announce the Electricity Tariff Adjustment Scheme, a program to support regional farmers, to support foundries, irrigators and employers. 
Over nine years, Speaker, we'll invest $52.3 million into 1,700 regional businesses through direct electricity rebates to keep regional Queenslanders in work and create, Speaker, even more jobs. This is direct investment in Queensland jobs and Queensland businesses, adding to the recently announced Queensland Jobs Fund. And I want to thank in particular the member for Maryborough for fighting for this important initiative and the Treasurer, of course, for backing this job-creating investment in the budget, Speaker. Now, whether you're a regional family, a farmer, or you run a small business, this Labor budget is backing you, Speaker. And while I'm on my feet, I can update Order. the House. I'd like to update the House on the situation at Callide Power Station, Speaker. After a tremendous effort involving a 300-strong workforce, at 4:30 p.m. yesterday, Unit B1 at Callide reconnected and is now delivering 154 megawatts as of this morning, Speaker. This is an important step in Callide's power station's recovery. Over coming days, the unit's output will be safely and gradually ramped up to its full capacity of 350 megawatts, Speaker. Unit B1 coming back online and operating safely is welcome news, welcome news to the workforce at Callide and the community that supports them, Mr Speaker. On behalf of Queensland, we say to the Callide workforce. Thank you. Is there any other government business? Are there any personal explanations? Are there any reports to be tabled? Are there any notices of motion? Honourable members, question time will conclude today at 11.16am. I call the Leader of the Opposition for his first question. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. The Australian Medical Association calls the budget disappointing, saying the hospital crisis will continue unless more is done. It's revealed they're meeting in secret so Queensland health doctors and staff can anonymously expose mismanagement of the health system without fear of retribution. Why is Labor afraid to listen to experts to fix the health crisis? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question. And, and can I say, I think it was um, well within the last week I had a, a great conversation with uh, Dr Chris Perry, head of the AMA, on the phone um, talking about a whole range of issues dealing with health, Mr Speaker. So, so I reject the premise of that question. I speak uh, regularly to the AMA. And I know the health minister speaks regularly to the AMA. You know, unlike unlike those opposite, unlike those opposite, remember the doctor's contracts? Oh. Marching, remember that, the doctor's contracts? Remember for model bus. Remember for model bus. The member for Playfield. They could, they could have a little chat across the nation, They sit next to each other, they could have a little reminiscence of what happened in those years. Oh, I remember it well. I remember it well. Pineapple Hotel. That's right, the Pineapple Hotel. That's right, the big Order. hotel. Uh, Mr Speaker, the people of Queensland trust our government to deliver health in this state to keep Queenslanders safe, unlike those opposite, Mr Speaker. And Mr Speaker... Mr Speaker, Member for Kiwana, I would be very silent. We'll go on to the lawyers and what the lawyers thought of you when you were in office. And the judges. And the judges. <laughs> I'm quite sure there are a lot of the secret judges meetings happening sleep. back then. <laughs> the attacks on the judiciary, the attacks on the health system, the attacks on the nurses, the attacks on the cleaners, the attacks on the doctors. Attacks on the TAFE teachers. Uh, Premier, uh, order. Speaker. Premier, can I uh, can I ask? Um, uh, sort of um, probably memory lane, we might come back to the question on this particular well, Mr. one. Speaker, may I remind you that you were also there as well. Uh, standing order one one eight. If you can be relevant to the question, Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have delivered a record health budget in this state, over twenty two billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I travelled the length and breadth of Queensland, as I said, I was out at out of Roma the other day, opening a brand new hospital delivered by this government. 
catering for no matter where people live in this state. And it doesn't just service Roma, it actually services that whole region, Mr Speaker. And it was great to see the member for, War member for Warrigo there as well, Mr Speaker. I even invited her to come up to come up and go on the tour with us and see the state-of-the-art medical facility that we have built for the people of Roma, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, can I remind those opposite of the Barrett Adolescent Centre that you shut, Mr Speaker. You closed it down. Yeah, you should still be hanging your heads in shame on that, Mr Speaker. And we know Premier's Mr. time Speaker. has expired. Mr. Premier will Mr. resume Mr. his seat. Mr. Premier Mr. will resume his seat. Oh, I just thought I'd come join in as well. I just thought it... <laughs> Leader of the Opposition, your second question. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. I refer the Minister to the Health Performance Stabilisation Measure in the Budget, which will end on 1 July 2022. Does the Minister expect the hospital crisis to end in a year? I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. And, uh, and can I say that uh, we're very proud of our Labor budgets for every year that we have been in government. Our record is clear when it comes to the health budget. Every single year since 2015, we have increased the health budget. Order. If the new strategy, well, it's not a new strategy, it's the old play. Members to my left. LNP, the same old playbook of the LNP to go around and scaremonger and now go out going, oh, there's no funding for health beyond 2022. I mean, don't be so ridiculous, Leader of the Opposition. Don't be so ridiculous. You've got no evidence to back uh, through up the chair. that Labor... Through the chair. Mr Speaker, Labor delivers record health budgets. We have the evidence... The, the runs are on the board. We know what the LNP runs are. When they talk about waiting lists for the waiting list, where did that term come from? Oh, that's right. Between 2012 and 2015, because people couldn't even get onto the waiting list. They couldn't Member for get Marichidor. onto the health There were people who Pause couldn't the clock. Get... Member for Marichidor, you're warned under standing orders. Uh, Treasurer, you will direct your comments through the chair. Minister for Health has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Sorry, um, Member for Marichido, you can leave the chamber. I've just warned you on standing orders. You've then interjected. You can leave the chamber for one hour. Understanding Order 2530. I've made myself clear, members, uh, regarding that uh, particular approach. Minister for Health has the call. Mr Speaker, uh, they may have ruled out savage cuts. They haven't ruled out cuts. What sort of cuts are acceptable for health? That's what I'd like to know from the Leader of the Opposition. What sort of cuts are acceptable? And can I also say to the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Speaker, and the question just put to the Premier, that I welcome the AMAQ in any input that they can add to the conversation about what's happening across the health system in Queensland the health system in Queensland, because they have the ability to also be consulting with the GPs on the ground and where we have shortages around the state, the changes to the Medicare benefit and what impact that's going to have on the public health system. So I welcome their com the conversation. And as far as secret meetings, it was the LNP who gagged public servants. It was the LNP who gagged NGOs. If you received government funds, you could not speak out. They were in absolute fear. I am very proud as the health minister as I travel around the state. Not only do I meet with senior chief executive staff and board members, I personally meet with clinicians 
and cleaners and wardies and nurses and midwives. I meet with the staff at all levels to hear directly from them, not through the executive, but to hear directly from them their views, because their views are just as important as anyone else, no matter what position in the health system. And I want to know their views, and I want their ideas as well. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Palmerston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier and Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on how the government's record health budget is delivering for Queenslanders? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Palmerstone for that question, Mr Speaker, because we have a very firm commitment that we're going to deliver seven satellite hospitals across South East Queensland, Mr yeah. Speaker, in this term of government. It was a signature policy of this government one which I'm absolutely committed and very determined to deliver. And I know that, that the Deputy Premier, when he was talking to me about this idea, it is like the first of its kind in Australia, Mr Speaker. I'm absolutely uh, delighted by that. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can, I can advise uh, the member for Palmerstone today that we have identified the land for the satellite hospital in Palmerstone, Mr Speaker. It's a 1.6 hectare parcel of land on First Avenue at Bongaree as preferred location for our satellite hospital on Bribey Island, Mr Speaker. So, so right near that high school, the Bribey Island State High School, this is fantastic news. I know the community have been raising with the member where is it going to be located, and today she can share that good news. And in further news, I can advise the member for Bundamba and the member for Jordan that we've identified the 2.7 hectare property on Barrams Road at South Ripley, adjacent to the Ripley Valley State School, as the preferred location for the satellite hospital to serve one of the fastest growing areas in our state. And I know that both of those members have also been hearing from their community. So, Mr Speaker, on this side of the House, we're getting on with the job. We're absolutely making sure that we deliver these satellite hospitals so people can get their Order. Maria has a call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And for those members who weren't here uh, during the uh, Campbell Newman years, uh, you you will Member for not Coomera. all the savage cuts that happened under the Newman government, Mr. Speaker. Member for Coomera is warned under standing and, orders. And whilst I mentioned savage, Mr. Speaker, um, it was interesting to, uh, as as the, as the Minister for Health was saying, when Peter Stefanovic asked the leader of the opposition, "Are you ruling out cuts?" I mean, big day today. We're going to. Hear a reply very soon with the uh, with uh, you know what those opposite want to do, Mr. Speaker. Will they channel the member for Clayfield? Anyway, uh, they asked they asked the, the the leader of the opposition, "Are you ruling out cuts?" And which he replied, "I'm ruling out being savage. Oh, wow. Ruling out being savage. Oh, wow. so there will be cuts. There will be cuts. There will be cuts. That's right." That's right. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that, that, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what that stare was before from the leader of the opposition. I think he was trying to. He was trying to channel, you know, Derek Zoolander in the parliament. You know, the big stare. You know, the big flute. And can I say? Premier's time has expired. I know Derek Zoolander. Uh, all ministers uh, will adhere to the time uh, allocated, uh, otherwise uh, there will be warnings issued. Uh, I call the member for Mudgeribar. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. I refer to the AMA's crisis meetings being held in secret so medicos can avoid professional retribution for speaking out about Labor's mismanagement of the health system. Will the minister admit Labor is losing control of the health system, causing frontline staff to stop treating sick Queenslanders and instead focus on fixing Labor's sick system? Uh, on a point of order. Point, a point of order. What is your point, point of, order? of order, Mr. Speaker? The question clearly contains an imputation about about retribution and consequences for public servants, which has been unsubstantiated. And I ask you to rule on the question, please. Uh, my, uh, my general view of, of uh, those matters, uh, Treasurer, is that uh, the 
Minister can refute um, uh, what is contained within the question, and I'll give latitude to, uh, to allow that if uh, she so wishes. I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh You've got to love the LNP. They're really agile, aren't they? I just answered the question. It's like, but I've still got the question. What do I do? Oh, I'll, I'll ask it again. I know she's already answered it. Um, <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for her question. I truly do. Uh, it is not a secret meeting when everyone's talking about it. So, uh, what is a secret meeting is a meeting on a yacht that people didn't know was going to happen on election day. Your own leader didn't know about it. Anyway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And look, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, uh, those opposite to get up and talk about retribution. How <laughs> astonishing! How astonishing! When I was elected in 2014, in opposition, public servants were too scared, too scared to even meet with me because they had been told they'd lose their job. They weren't allowed to talk to me. The, the former member for Ashgrove knows she had Order. that fear, that retribution. On election day, the firings who were on the ground supporting me at the booth and supporting member the for Kiwana were being asked what station they worked at and what their number was. NGOs were gagged were not allowed to speak up. Chris Davis, he himself, one of the LNP members, talked about being bullied. He's not the only one who, who's recently left the LNP who's talked about bullying. So to come into this chamber and talk about doctors and nurses and, and health workers being in fear of retribution, from, from those who had a pain ranking That's right. to help decide their budget cuts. Sorry. Pain Sorry. ranking. I got told the stories where, where staff were told Order. to walk into an empty room where there was a phone on a table and sit and wait for it to ring to tell you if you've lost your job. Sorry. I still have people today coming up to me saying that they struggle to find employment because of what the LNP did. Right. They, the people of Queensland have not forgotten. So the LNP cannot come here talking about retribution with the, with the history that they have. The only thing the LNP should be doing is getting up and apologising to the health workers for what they did to them. And nothing less than that is acceptable. Speaker. Speaker. I call the member for Kapalaba. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Premier and the Minister for Trade. Will the Premier update the House on the Palaszczuk government's commitment to training and skills in this year's budget and is she aware of any alternative approaches? I call the Premier. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And of course, uh, we're committed to skills and training because we believe that we've got to give people the best opportunity to get a job, and the best way to do that is to get them the skills and training in a whole variety of fields. And I know that the member for Kapalaba is also a very keen supporter of our, our TAFEs in our state. And uh, next week we'll be down, I'll be coming down to uh, Capella Bart for the brand new for the opening of the ten million dollar uh, at the Alexandra Hills TAFE, the ten million dollar expansion. And that's that's wonderful to see. And uh, Minister Farmer and I were recently down the Gold Coast um, with Minister Scanlon as well, looking at the upgrades to the TAFE there. So we invest in TAFE, we value TAFE. When we know those opposite wanted to dismantle TAFE and destroy TAFE. We know that we back skilling Queenslanders for work. Massive injection in money, keeping that rolling over for the next four years, Mr Speaker. They actually stopped skilling Queenslanders Sorry. for work. They rejected the recommendation to keep skilling Queenslanders for work going. They stopped it, Mr Speaker, in its tracks, and it has given people such good, secure, long-term employment in this state. So on this side of the House, we will always back TAFE. We will back our signature programs of skilling Queenslanders for TAFE. And we will also back our programs of back to work, making sure that there is uh, apprenticeship opportunities for young people as well, no matter where they live. And everywhere I go, whether it's on projects, 
such as Cross River Rail, I'm meeting the apprentices. When I'm going through the schools with the Minister for Education, we are meeting the apprentices. We are making sure that with our government builds, there is a percentage of people working there getting those apprenticeships, and we are also investing in those skills when it comes to hydrogen, with the expansion of uh, the Plumber Centre down there for hydrogen, uh, Bean Lee. Uh, where we held our campaign launch, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, yeah. what a great, what a great day, day that was! What a great day that was! <laughs> They're mixing with the workers Not and the young people, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but those opposite, uh, all we see from them is uh, stunts, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. You know, the other day we saw we saw the cupboard, Mr. Speaker. You know, the cupboard from the member for Kwana. He obviously misplaced his pet rat that he uh, <laughs> he often brings in, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and Mr. Speaker, look for the benefit of the house. For the benefit of the house, you know, you know, on, on the leader of the opposition's website, members to my left, the cupboard, the bear cupboard, you know, it's had 404 views. 404 views, leader of the opposition. Uh, can I say to the leader of the opposition uh, on on my Facebook? My mum's cat, my mum's cat has got 4.3 thousand views, Mr. Speaker. 4.3 thousand views. There it is, mum's cat. There's your cupboard. Mr. Speaker. Order, members. Order. I call the I call the member for Southport. Mr Speaker, a question to the Health Minister. The Minister says, and I quote, there is record funding for every HHS, health, health and Hospital Service. However, comparing current actual funding to next year's budget shows that the HHSs will receive $74 million less funding next year. The Gold Coast alone is receiving $52 million less funding for the front line than this year. If the minister can't run her own budget, how can the minister run the health system? Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to rule uh, on that question. That the preamble is too lengthy, and, and I will rule that question uh, out of order. Please Mr. resume your seat, member for Southport. You don't get another go at that one. Mr. Speaker. I call the member for Ipswich West. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is of the Deputy Premier and Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Can the Deputy Premier update the House on the progress of providing regional quarantine facilities in Queensland? I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, Ipswich West for his question. It is a good question and a timely question because today, Mr. Speaker, because of the inaction of Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the risk of a lockdown hangs like a cloud over our most populous city. Mr. Speaker, Australia needs regional quarantine facilities. The Commonwealth Government needs to deliver enhanced, more effective quarantine facilities. Quarantine is the responsibility of the Federal Government. In fact, in 1901, it was the only health responsibility given to the Federal Government. But what has, what has the Prime Minister done on it? Nothing. Nothing. Left it to the states blamed the states. And as you've just heard, Mr Speaker, the Health Minister has outlined to the House that there are two cases of community transmission in Sydney linked to hotel quarantine. As a result, there are 15 uh, contact sites, uh, risk of infection on public transport, and the threat, if they can't get on top of it quickly enough, of new restrictions and lockdowns, a threat that could have been avoided could have been avoided if the Prime Minister had done his job under the Constitution. New South Wales has now joined Queensland and Victoria and Western Australia in calling for their own regional quarantine facility. That is an idea that started here in Queensland and has now spread to the other states. And we have provided to the Commonwealth a detailed, costed proposal—95 pages of detail. And they've had 
They've had this proposal for months and months and months. And you know what, Mr Speaker, there is a commitment to deliver it in our budget, delivered this week. All we need is for the Morrison government to agree to support it. We will deliver a purpose-built infection control facility for a thousand passengers who can travel directly from the World Camp Airport to the facility. It's much like the Victorian proposal that the Prime Minister says he supports, except it's bigger, it's cheaper, and it can be delivered faster than theirs can. And so we're left wondering why. What's so good about Victoria? Why does the federal government hate Queensland so much that they will support an inferior facility in Victoria but not a superior facility here in Queensland, budgeted for by the Queensland government? 21 times now this virus has escaped hotel quarantine and if it happens again here in Queensland, we will know Scott Morrison's to blame. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Warrego. Mr Speaker, a question to the Deputy Premier. Will the Minister commit to continuing the advance payments for the municipal solid waste beyond 2022 to local councils, or is Labor going to slap every Queenslander with another bill of around $80? I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, as the Treasurer confirmed in the budget, uh, that 105 per cent ongoing rebate of the waste levy will continue for the next 12 months, up until the point in time that the legislation said that it would be reviewed. And that's precisely what the budget said, precisely what our commitments have been, and precisely what we will do, Mr Speaker. But they've got a nerve yeah. coming in here and talking about a waste levy. The, the, the sole reason, the sole reason we had to bring in a waste levy, is because Blue Steel over here <laughs> abolished it uh, in 2012. Deputy Premier. The, the bloke, Deputy Premier. The bloke, Deputy Premier. <laughs> correct titles will be used in this chamber. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what was the result? What was the result? He abolished the waste levy and the trucks started. Truck after truck after truck of waste from New South Wales dumped in Ipswich because those opposite, those opposite could not maintain a sensible waste policy, would not maintain a policy that incentivised recycling and waste recovery because those opposite did not want the jobs did not want the jobs that come with recycling and waste recovery. And not for a second have they yet acknowledged that failure. Not for a second have they admitted that those trucks became because the member for Broadwater, the worst local government minister in recent history, refused to maintain the waste levy, abolished it, abolished the incentive abolished the support for an incredibly important industry. And the result was a collapse in confidence, a collapse Absolutely. in investment into new waste recycling and recovery facilities, one that the state is still recovering from and that industry is still recovering from. You talk to anybody in that industry and they talk about how facilities that they had built when there was a price on waste were suddenly not viable. When projects that they planned to build, investments that they planned to make, had the rug pulled out under them by the member for Broadwater when he abolished the waste levy. Well, we brought it back. It is working. It is creating jobs in waste and resource recovery. It is driving investment into local governments right across uh, this great state. Order. Speaker. I call the member for Keppel. Speaker, my question is of the Treasurer and Minister for Investment. Will the Treasurer please advise how the government is ensuring frontline services can grow for the benefit of all Queenslanders, and is the Treasurer aware of all other approaches to funding the frontline? I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the member for Keppel for her question and her interest in the Queensland budget. Nice to get a question on the Queensland budget today, member for Keppel, because the member for Keppel knows how important it is for Queenslanders 
uh, to know, uh, wherever they live in the state, that they can be confident they can access the services they need and they deserve. Over financial year 2021-22, the budget papers show the workforce of Queensland Health will grow by 2,327. Speaker. In the Queensland Police Service, the member for Keppel will be pleased to know the workforce will grow by 1,075. In education, the workforce will grow by 372. And in the Queensland Fire and Emergency Service, it will grow by 272. Speaker, that growth is what we need to deliver the services that Queenslanders need and deserve. And it will be delivered because it is what is required for our state. But that delivery is something no Queenslanders can be, no Queenslander can be assured of under the LNP. In one of his regular forays on Sky News, I, I heard last night the Leader of the Opposition speaker, and he was asked how he would pay down debt, how the Leader of the Opposition would pay down debt. And the Leader of the Opposition said the LNP would only borrow to create income, not for things that are, quote, nice to have. Speaker, I can assure members on this side of the House, nurses and police and doctors are, and firefighters and teachers, they don't create income. And I wonder if they are in his nice-to-have category, the Leader of the Opposition's nice-to-have category. Well, we didn't have to wait long for the answer, but because the Leader of the Opposition was asked, are you ruling out cuts? And quick as a flash, he said, I'm ruling out being savage. I'm ruling out being savage. Well, that was nice to hear, wasn't it, Speaker? I'm ruling out making mistakes. Mark down the 17th of July, 2021, Speaker. That is the day Order. the Leader of the set out the LNP strategy, and that is to cut. Speaker, this is the party and a minister in the Newman government that cut 14,000 public servants. You cut 14,000 workers. Deputy Leader of the, of the Opposition. Speaker. They never said it was savage, and they still don't think it was a mistake. The reward leader of the, opposition. the Leader of the Opposition gives to frontline public servants for their strength and resilience and their leader dedication the during COVID-19 is to throw them on the scrap heap of unemployment the next time Queensland faces an emergency. He also said he had no, no problem with transparency in the costings process. Well, I tell you what, the member for Everton choked on his cornflakes when he heard that after the worst costings debacle in history. Talk about transparency and costings, Speaker. What about the Bruce Highway? hoax and the fake Bradfield scheme. No transparency there. Order. Led by the Leader of the Opposition are a bunch of phonies. Mr Speaker, and he's right his at the time top. has expired. Mr Speaker. I'll wait for silence, members. I call the member for Bonnie. Mr Speaker, a question to the Premier. The Premier told Queenslanders they wouldn't have to pay the waste levy, saying, and I quote, Queensland families will not face the cost of this levy. Will the Premier guarantee municipal solid waste advance payments to councils will continue past 2022 so Queenslanders are not asked to fork out around $80 more every year? I call the Premier. Thank you very much. I thank the member for the question. The Deputy Premier addressed this in detail. You lot abolished it, Mr. Uh, to the Chair, Premier. Sorry. Well, those of and look. Bonnie. The member for Bonnie, the member for, the member for Bonnie wasn't here for that. Did you go talk to his leader, the person who didn't care about waste in this state at all, Mr Speaker? We are growing the industry, we are growing jobs, Mr Speaker, and as we said very clearly, those, uh, those whole issues are being put of the next budget, Mr Speaker, and we are not putting any any impost whatsoever on domestic waste. Mr Speaker. I call the member for Bundamba. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is of the Minister for Education, Minister for Industrial Relations and Minister for Racing. Will the minister advise how the Palaszczuk government has invested in education infrastructure in Queensland schools and advise if there are any alternative approaches? I call the minister. I thank the member for the question. I know the member has a very keen interest in 
education infrastructure in his area is a fast growing area and it is an absolute pleasure to be with him when we open these fantastic schools that we are now planning and we have already opened like Ripley State School, Ripley State Secondary College, two outstanding world-class facilities and it was also a pleasure to join him at the Goodness Special School recently when we opened up an amazing new building for that um, special school. Um, can I thank um, Principal Fleur Watson and the um, class um, school leaders who welcomed us to Goodness Special School. It was amazing to see the new learning centre, Yakadagan, um, which is now opened, and um, those students are well behaved and so um, eminently entertained by Goodness State School Indigenous Dance Group. It was uh, an incredible day, and this has been repeated. And the member knows that in a fast growing area, you need to put in resources. You don't sell land, you don't sell schools, you actually plan for the future. And that is exactly what we are doing. And it's growing massively there, and there's $67 million of work planned or underway on the schools in the members electorate. And and we've got schools planned for Ripley Valley, Bellbird Park and Redland and Red Bank Plains. And I can't wait to deliver those on time and on budget. There's also extra classrooms at Bellbird Park, State Secondary College, Fernbrook State School and Goodness Special School are getting even more additional classrooms and buildings. And upgrades at Goodna and Renbank Plains State School. And this is happening, Speaker, as I outlined earlier today, right across the state. Member for Gregory. Uh, infrastructure budget, that is second to none. And can I say, these are solid projects. These are solidly delivering for our schools and students. There's no gimmicks. There's no stupid empty cupboards. There's no ridiculous spinning wheels. You really have to think about how long does it take the Leader of the Opposition to get the member for Kiwana to spend his weekends spinning wheels. I mean, they must have nothing Order. to do. Well, we know they can't read a budget. They didn't go to Beef Week. So what have you got to do? Can you can you do something with a spinning wheel? That's a really top stupid idea. But then they thought about maybe we should Order. Use But they've used that one already. The rat on the Donna shoulder was used already. Speaker, we have genuine solid infrastructure for schools. They're not gimmicks, they're real good spending. This time has expired. I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, a question to the Treasurer. The Code of Ethical Standards provides members have a duty correct to correct the official record in the House as soon as it becomes apparent that their statements were incorrect or could be misleading. When was it first apparent to the Treasurer the $4.2 billion valuation of the Titles Office he referred to during debate on the Debt Reduction and Savings Bill was incorrect and could be misleading? Uh, I call the Treasurer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Toowoomba South for the, uh, for the question. I, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about what happened in the last sitting week, but something let me think, something special happened this sitting week, I think. It might have been, might have been the budget, but I look, I thank the member for Toowoomba South for the question. Order. I, I thought he'd been benched there for a while. I thought he had two questions in the week and got a bit puffed, had to have the day off, but he's come back strongly. He's come back strongly to ask me a question about something that happened in the last sitting week and nothing about the budget, Speaker. I comprehensively provided the statement to the House yesterday uh, for all members of the House's information. Mr Speaker. Order. I've uh, previously made uh, rulings about those kinds of interjections, uh, and that is uh, essentially a group interjection. <laughs> Member for Kapalabar, I'm giving a ruling. You're warned under standing orders. I call the member for Cairns. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Can the Minister uh, outline how the Palaszczuk Government is supporting the hard-working hospital and health services in my community of Cairns and uh, through the 2021 budget, 
And is the uh, Minister aware of any alternative approaches? I call the Minister for Health. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Cairns for his question. Uh, and as we know, a very strong advocate for health services in his area. It is the Palaszczuk Labor government that is ensuring that our health system will remain strong to care for Queenslanders. And I'm proud that the Cairns and Hinterland Hospital and Health Service will benefit from this year's health budget with a $1.08 billion budget, which is up $30 million from the previous budget. Through our record $22.2 billion health budget, the Palaszczuk government continues to deliver world-class health care outcomes for every resident throughout the state. And I'm pleased to update the House that thanks to, in great part, the staunch advocacy of the member for Cairns, and uh, we know member for Mulgrave also advocates very, very strongly for the area as well. We are fast-tracking the expansion of the Cairns Hospital Emergency Department. Construction works are set to commence as early as September this year. The expanded ED, worth $26.4 million, is expected to be delivered now six months ahead of schedule. It builds upon our government's significant investment to support health care in the far north. We are pressing full steam ahead with the master planning required to deliver the new Cairns University Hospital. Importantly, we are also delivering a new mental health unit and an endoscopy room to com complement the Cairns Hospital ED expansion. We are also investing in significant upgrades in the far north, the Atherton Hospital redevelopment worth more than $70 million and the $10 million upgrade to Mossman Hospital ED, just to name a few. And it was wonderful to visit that Mossman Hospital recently and see just it, this is a really difficult site to do a refurbishment on when you've got a heritage listed building. Uh, an amazing building but not, not fit for purpose anymore and to see the fit out of the new ED, I know the staff were just so excited about that coming online. But let's talk about what we could be facing instead, those opposite, the legacy of the LMP. We know when they were last in power they sacked 4,400 health workers, including 1,800 nurses and midwives. In Cairns, they sacked more than four, uh, 300 doctors and nurses. The consequences were dire for, for the staff up there. And as I said in one of my previous answers, I still meet, I still meet public servants, including health workers today, who less, lost their jobs under the LMP. Now, I remember door knocking and meeting a mum in Bracken Ridge, in fact telling me that she was having to move to the Northern Territory. She was a single mum and she had lost her job and she was now having to move away from family because it was the only way she could get a nursing job. And I still remember that conversation on that doorstep. Uh, and uh, those, those messages continue to, to live with me. But I am so proud of the Labor government. Our budget, $22.2 billion, delivering for Cairns, but delivering for... Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Hinchinbrook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. Queensland legislation empowers RSPCA as a third party to conduct themselves as animal welfare police. It's alleged that the RSPCA are using these powers to extort and shut down competition for financial gain. Will the minister advise what oversight the department has over the RSPCA and what protection, protections the government can provide for those that claim harassment? I call the Minister of Agricultural, Industry, Development and Fisheries. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for Hinchinbrook for his question and acknowledge his work and interest in this particular area. Speaker, the Animal Care and Protection Act uh, 2001 promotes the responsibility and also the care and use of animals in our state of Queensland. The Act places a legal duty of care on all those who own or are in charge of animals. The Act also provides for offences to persons who breach that duty of care or are found to be cruel to animals. The Act is enforced jointly by Biosecurity Queensland and also the RSPCA of Queensland under an agreement that defines the roles and those responsibilities of each agency and the services to be provided. The agreement describes the agreed work relationship for administrating the Animal Care and Protection Act uh, 2001, and the agreements cover areas of, of jurisdiction, transfer and assistance uh, policies, and also for complaints, training and appointment requirements, and the accountability of reporting mechanisms. Under the agreement, RSPCA uh, inspectors have primary enforcement responsibility in the area in which they are located for animal welfare complaints involving companion animals, wild, wildlife, 
zoos, riding schools, pet shops and rodeos. Within our SPCA areas, Biosecurity Queensland inspectors have primary enforcement responsibility in relation to animals used in commercial livestock production and for feral livestock animals. In areas where RSPCA is not represented, Biosecurity Queensland inspectors take primary responsibility for, in, for enforcement. The RSPCA Queensland is an important animal welfare partner within the Queensland Government and will continue to work in partnership to protect the welfare of all animals in Queensland. Uh, in December 2020, the Palaszczuk gave, gave, gave a commitment to and also announced a review of the Act. The Department has since released a discussion paper for public consultation between the 4th of April and 21 May, hence has been closed, and the Department received approximately 914 uh, written submissions and 1,456 uh, responses to this online survey by the consultation closing date. The Department is now considering all feedback received and is developing proposals for amendment to the ACPA uh, based on that feedback. I'm encouraged and looking forward to see that feedback from all those participants and I thank them for their interest and engagement in making sure we get the, the uh, matter right. I'm more than happy to make sure that the member is kept up to date with the regular briefings and once again I do encourage and uh, recognise the, the interests of the uh, Cat Australia Party in this area of, of, of this interest, but also agriculture in general and any other matters into the future. And I'll continue engaging with, with the member or anyone else in this uh, chamber that has an interest, in, not only in this area, but right across the sector of my broad interest of, of, of agriculture under my responsibilities. I call the member for Moneyborough. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Police and Corrective Services and Minister for Fire and Emergency Services. With yet another record police budget delivering more police and more police resources right across the regional, regional Queensland, will the Minister please advise of a time when this wasn't the case? Uh, I call the Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Mundingborough, a strong supporter of the Queensland Police Service. And he's right, it is a record police budget, Speaker. Record police budget, uh, $2.86 billion. And, and for those opposite who struggle to you know, read one of these documents, even know what it looks like, like there's not even any glossy pictures on the front to distract them. Uh, budget paper number three, there's three little dots here, the one, two, three, so you can work out what budget paper three is. But if we have a look at the, if we have a look at the capital statement here for the Queensland Police Service, we see record investment, record investment. Oh, oh well, hang on, page number 87. Uh, that's eight and a seven, 87. Uh, and massive investment, ma massive investment in the Queensland Police Service when it comes to facilities and resources. So right across the state, what does this budget deliver for the Queensland Police Service? It's progressing facilities at Arracoon, Bow Desert, Biloela, Burketown, Cairns, Cairns West, Clermont, Caroy, Cunnamulla, Dolby, Dabra, Harvey Bay, Kerwin, Mackay, Maribor, Nambour, Pampermar, Pomparau, Ripley, Rosewood, Warwick and Waree, Mr Speaker. A record budget, a record budget investing in the Queensland Police Service. But we know, Mr Speaker, that they, those opposite always have a plan to cut the police service. We saw at the last election that they weren't going to match our commitment about a record investment in extra police resources. And what that would mean is police resources would be cut in particular areas. And I, I liked, I liked uh, the member for Burdekin's uh, comment in the Townsville Bulletin just yesterday, where he said, he said, fighting crime was not about the number of police on the streets. Because, why would they say that? Because they want to cut the number of police on the streets. Let's have a look at the cutometer there, Mr uh, Speaker. Devon, put that down Devon Dale and David's cuts document. in Townsville in the north, 90 less police. That was their commitment at the last election, Speaker. And when we see those opposite and their agenda around the Queensland Police Service, it's always savage. Always savage. Cut, 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 cut. And of course, the member for Broadwater backed that in yesterday when he said that there would be cuts. There would be cuts. He says they won't be savage, but whenever it comes to the Queensland Police Service and the LNP, it's always savage. What did they do when they were last in government, Speaker? Well, the cuts that they inflicted on the Queensland Police Service meant that 110 senior police were gone. 300 police per personnel gone. They cut training. They cut. 
They cut resources. They made police buy their own body-worn cameras. They cut funding to the National Motor Vehicle Theft Reduction Council. And I, the most heinous thing of all, Speaker, the most heinous thing of all, they actually cut the monitoring of sex offenders. 1,700 sex offenders let off the hook because of legislation changes by them, Speaker. When it comes to backing the Queensland Police Service, Speaker, it's our government that delivers every single time. I call the member for Noosa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. I refer to our ongoing advocacy for Katie Rose Hospice and ask, Will the minister ensure existing accredited hospice services be provided with the same level of funding as other palliative care providers from Queensland, Queensland Health's additional $171 million for end-of-life and palliative care? I call the Minister for Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Noosa for her question. And, uh, as we all know, uh, palliative care is an important service that we must continue to invest in across this state. And uh, as I have said uh, in recent times, uh, it was a pleasure to, uh, to go to the Longreach Hospital recently and see that they were near completion. In fact, I've just been told that they've completed the new palliative care unit, so I'm looking forward to going up there and, and seeing it completed um, to give families you know, more support and comfort where they do have to provide that care in the hospital. But of course, we don't want it all to be provided in the hospital. Where we can, we want that palliative care uh, provided at home. Uh, and that's why the Palaszczuk government did announce at the election an, an additional $171 million um, over the forward estimates to develop and implement new palliative and end-of-life care strategy, invest in community-based services, develop a workforce plan to support a specialist palliative care workforce and support practitioners and deliver public education and advocacy. Um, in relation to the member for Noosa's question, of course, um, that is in addition to existing funding. Uh, in relation to Katie Rose Cottage, I am advised that the current funding uh, with the Department of Health goes through to the middle of 2022. Uh, so the process would be followed, um, as is the normal process, that future funding beyond that mid-22 would be part of any reconsideration by the department prior to the expiry date. Um, it is important, and I, you know, as a minister, I believe it's important that we give certainty to organisations, so that reconsideration should be uh, done in advance so organisations know uh, whether their funding is continuing or not. Um, I'm a big supporter of that, but we are talking um, over a year away, uh, and so that work will be done over the next 12 months to be looking at that. But I was pleased not only does Katie, Cottage, uh, Katie Rose Cottage get existing funding, uh, but they also got ad additional funding, as I understand, uh, with the $12.9 million to non-government organisations during 2021 uh, to deliver palliative care services in the community. So um, I'm pleased that they have been able to benefit uh, from that uh, funding. I want to acknowledge all of our health workers who work in this space, our additional nurses and midwives, and the creation of a new role of palliative care nurse navigator. I think this is a really important role, and I'm, I'm so pleased uh, that we are able to fund these positions within the health system. I'll continue to work with uh, not just our hospitals, but our NGO sector around palliative care to make sure that uh, without um, going to the detail of a bill before the House, to make sure that people have an option uh, and understand that there is support in the community to make decisions around their end-of-life care. Well, I call the member for Mackay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Agricultural Industry Development and Fisheries and the Minister for Rural Communities. Will the Minister update the House on how the Palaszczuk Government is supporting farmers through the 2021 budget and can he advise of any alternative approaches? I call the Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I, I, do, I do thank the member for Mackay for her question, Speaker, because she sh shares the same interests, the same in intimate interests that every member of the Palaszczuk government on this side of the chamber has for our men, our women, the primary producers that put the food on our plates uh, every day of the week, Speaker. So uh, it's one of those backbone bones of, of our economy. It's going to help us deliver deliver our, our Queensland plan for our economic recovery out of this pandemic. 
Uh, Speaker, 2020, no doubt, was a year of global disruption because of the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. And that pandemic, no doubt, is still causing issues of uncertainty today. But I want to commend the Treasurer on this budget, uh, Speaker. It's, it's a budget that delivers for agriculture. It's the heart of, of the, the Treasurer's uh, focus in terms of agriculture, given his background of being a senior policy adviser under the previous uh, government, working for a great uh, a primary producer, uh, Minister Henry Palaszczuk, Speaker. Um, because this budget, Speaker, will give our producers more certainty in these uncertain times. And with this budget, we will continue to invest in key foundation blocks, deliver that long-term sustainability of growth right across our supply chain. And, Speaker, the Premier delivered a ministerial statement this morning quite eloquently, touching on all those key points, but I want to once again touch on those. $42.5 million in terms of the next four years in continuing fishery reforms. $71.4 million in terms of drought reform package, a reform package that is well received and supported by AgForce and other stakeholders in, in our uh, area. Biosecurity operations of $8.1 million over the next four years. And, Speaker, when it comes to comparing the Palaszczuk government's record in agriculture to the LNB, there's stark differences. Stark differences in this regard, uh, Speaker. More like comparing apples with bull dust. Speaker, <laughs> it's all, all black and white, Speaker. And in 2019, we, we delivered $525 million in our budget for this portfolio, $556 million in the budget last year, but this year $523 million as well. So a record three consecutive years of delivering more than half a billion dollars in agriculture across this state. In comparison, the LNP budget in 2012 442.4 million. Their second budget, 403 million. And their third budget, $408 million. But it went further than that, Speaker. If you look at the record of what they did to the staff in this amazing portfolio, more than 600 staff in agriculture were cut, cut to the bone, cut to the bone by this mob opposite. Uh, in respect to this area. So they have no record when it comes to agriculture in this House. It is only a Palaszczuk that lives in this area. Minister's time has expired. I call the member for Kiwana. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A question to the Minister for Infrastructure. Labor is reducing the infrastructure budget by 9 per cent, down from $56.03 billion to $52.2 billion, meaning this year's infrastructure spending is less than the 10-year average. Where is Labor's plan for infrastructure needed to protect Queensland's lifestyle in the future? I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, the member for Kiwana asks, where is uh, Labor's plan to deliver the infrastructure of the future? And for the benefit of the member for Kiwana, there was a whole series of booklets uh, that the Treasurer tabled earlier in the week that fully details uh, Please put that down plan the document at, yes, at length. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you did, member for Kiwana, because if you had... If you had, you'd know uh, the that, comments will come through the first chair. First of all, the budget uh, more than delivers on the Palaszczuk government's infrastructure guarantee that we will spend more than uh, 50 billion each and every year. Indeed, in the next financial year, we will spend 52.2 billion. That is more than more than the 50 billion dollar uh, guarantee. In fact, uh, but over the 10 years to 24-25, this government will have spent $110 billion on infrastructure works, improving our state, making our economy what, say that again, $110 billion, Mr Speaker. But if you want to talk about if you want to talk about what a reduction would look like, Mr Speaker, or a shrinkage a shrinkage would be if we went back to the infrastructure spend that those opposite yeah, committed to. That's a big shrinkage. Because uh, they were spending $43 billion on infrastructure in their last two budgets. Now, now the, the Treasurer is more responsible for the mathing than I am, but it, is, is 43 less than 52? Less than 52. Quite, quite a bit uh, less. In fact, in their first budget, they made a virtue of shrinking the infrastructure spend. The member for Clayfield boasted, boasted that his budget was cutting infrastructure spending, cutting infrastructure spending in order to deliver on their cruel, their savage austerity measures. 
Mr Speaker, it is very, very clear that it is this government that has a plan for infrastructure. Infrastructure like Cross River Rail that would be built by now if you hadn't cut it, if you hadn't cut it Order. and knocked back federal government funding for it. Member for Clayfield, member for Chatsworth. Gold Coast Light Rail Stage 3. Member Another for Chatsworth will cease his injections. being delivered uh, by this government and in this budget. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, the numbers speak for themselves. We are investing more and more into infrastructure right across this state, and we will continue to do so over the forwards uh, and beyond, including, including to deliver the infrastructure needed for the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Yeah. Speaker. I call the member for Thurringawa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is of the Minister for Employment and Small Business and Minister for Training and Skills Development. Can the Minister update the House on the Palaszczuk uh, Government's investment in TAFE infrastructure for the hydrogen and renewable jobs of the future? And is she aware of any alternative uh, approaches? Uh, Minister, two minutes to respond. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. And we have many conversations about our investment in TAFE, um, which is about equipping Queensland for future jobs. And, Speaker, that includes TAFE infrastructure. Last year's budget, uh, we announced a $100 million three year program to invest in TAFE facility upgrades and, and new facilities across the state. And I I'm very pleased to say that all of those projects will be either completed or underway by August next year, and that includes our $10.6 million hydrogen and renewable energy training facility at Bowley Campus Speaker. But we've also made other investments uh, in infrastructure around a renewable speaker. We've got the $20 million, which the uh, Premier referred to for the PICAC Centre, new hydrogen training centre of excellence in Bean Lee, where uh, we did our, our campaign launch and the Minister for Energy and the Treasurer and I did the sod turning earlier in the year and I know that the Education Minister and the Member for Gladstone are really excited about the $2 million at Gladstone State High School. And Speaker, this all underpins our renewable energy target of 50 per cent by 2030, Speaker. And there is, it seems to be an announcement almost every week about what we're doing in this space, which actually makes the comparison with the LNP's position actually more and more embarrassing almost every week, Speaker, because we know they went to the election saying they were scrapping the renewable energy target and that they actually call renewable energy a fantasy. We had the member for Callide, he had ads up on Facebook before the election saying that renewable energy, the fantasy of renewables was holding us back, Speaker. He even linked to a little article um, about a report that had been commissioned by that really well-known renewable energy expert, uh, Malcolm Roberts, the One Nation Senator, Speaker. Um, this is simply their attitude is an attack on jobs, Speaker. It's a conspiracy theory. What we need to be doing is looking to the future, and that's what our investment in TAFE infrastructure is all about. The period for question time has expired. I call the clerk to read the next order of the day. Government business order of the day number one, appropriation parliament bill, appropriation bill, second readings to be moved, cognate debate. I call the Treasurer. Uh, speaker, I move that the bills be now read a second time. I call the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it's a great honour to give this budget reply today, not only on behalf of the Opposition, but on behalf of all Queenslanders. Those who vote for us, those who don't. Without doubt, Queensland is stronger with an Opposition that is hungry for detail and eager to hold the Government to account. To stay true to this objective, the process must strive to be open and transparent. The government has a responsibility to honour this objective, not just in the budget documents themselves, but also in the communication to the people of Queensland. In this spirit, the budget should not just be about large, abstract numbers, but rather a demonstration of how it will help honest Queenslanders in their everyday lives. Mr Speaker, when I was chosen to lead the opposition, I promised Queenslanders I would talk with them about the issues that mattered to them. Since then, I have spoken to thousands of Queenslanders across this great state. What has followed is the inundation of my office with the personal stories of Queenslanders impacted by the failure of the government to deliver basic services. A budget should give people hope. It should reassure them they have been listened to and that help is on the way. 
At the very least, it should acknowledge the failures and work to ensure these tragic stories are not visited upon further victims. It is my responsibility as opposition leader to speak for these people and ask, where in this budget is the opportunity? Where is the reassurance? Where is the hope? Mr Speaker, where in this budget is the reassurance from Julie from Redcliffe, who joins us today? Julie's mum, Gwen, waited six hours in February and 12 hours in March for an ambulance after suffering falls. And last month, Julie's aunt suffered a medical episode and waited 10 hours for help to arrive. What reassurance and hope does a budget that cuts capital expenditure in health give to Julie? Mr Speaker, where in this budget is the hope for Wendy? Wendy has been looking for a rental property on the Gold Coast since November last year. After going to more than 100 inspections without success, what reassurance and hope does a budget that cuts infrastructure spending give to Wendy? Mr Speaker, where in this budget is the opportunity for Rodney from the Sunshine Coast? Rodney runs a compliance and labour supply business for agricultural and horticulture businesses in Queensland. His clients are struggling due to huge labour shortages of fruit pickers and his own business is weighed down by bureaucratic red tape. What reassurance and hope does a budget prefaced on the abolition of a productivity commission give to Rodney? Mr Speaker, where in this budget is the reassurance and hope for Alan, who's watching us today from Townsville? Alan's ute was rammed by thieves when he stopped to help a woman whose house was being broken into on the way to work. What reassurance and hope does a budget that provides no funding towards the reinstatement of breach of bail as an offence give to Alan? Mr Speaker, a budget that fails to give answers to these Queenslanders fails all Queenslanders. Yeah. The reason the government cannot provide these answers is they are losing control of the things that matter to Queensland. They are losing control of law and order. They are losing control of housing and they are losing control of the health system. The Australian Labor Party has a long history in this state of overseeing a continual state of crisis within the health system. Who can forget the extraordinary admission of the former Premier Bly when faced with exceptional failures overseen by her and those who sat around her cabinet table was forced to admit that Queensland Health was a basket case. Sadly, we are back to these bad old days. Ramping levels have hit 40 per cent across the state. It was 30 per cent during the Bly basket case. Elective surgery waiting lists have reached 55,000. It was 36,000 during the Bly basket case. Dental waiting lists are now at 150,000 Queenslanders. It was 60,000 during the Bly basket case. The budget doesn't provide hope, whether it be downgrades to the promised hospital in Bundaberg, the broken promise on the hospital in the Redlands, or the inability to deliver a kidney transplant unit in the North. Labor is losing control of the health system and Queenslanders are paying for it with their physical well-being and in some cases, tragically, their lives. We have heard ad nauseum about the record health budget, a spend unmatched to all years which have gone before. We've heard this line rolled out by the health minister, the treasurer, and even the premier, like it's something new, as if it will be the panacea to the crisis situation which our public health system now finds itself in. In our emergency departments, one in four people are not seen within the clinically re recommended time based on their need. A record health budget, particularly an increase that's struggling to keep pace with inflation, isn't a out health outcome. In fact, it's meaningless to the millions of people who rely on our health system each year. Ask Steve, whose wife died in his arms for an ambulance to arrive what a health record budget means to him or Patricia, who waited not months but years for a hip replacement to ease her chronic pain. It was a record health budget last year, Mr Speaker, and the year before that, and the year before that, and still the horror stories continue to mount. Queensland Health needs cultural change, money to support the front line and transparency in what it does. 
But how can a government expect transparency from its departments when its signature $2 billion hospital building fund has no money allocated to build a single hospital? These issues have been exposed by a campaign led by the Shadow Minister for Health. As a, as a registered nurse, she knows what matters on the front line. The numbers are real and the people behind them are real and they won't be silenced. In the last week, we've spoken with honest Queenslanders from across the state, desperate for a better functioning and more responsive health system. Like the thousands who have reached out to my office in the last six months, they were courageous enough to tell their story. Doctors, nurses, paramedics, grandparents, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. At every session, we have had current Queensland health staff come and give their feedback on how to fix the broken system they labour under. Not one of them sought to blame a clinician, and nor should they, because we know what an outstanding job those on the front line of our health services do. A light was shone upon the work they carry out day in, day out, and we are proud and grateful for them all. Unfortunately, the government is focused on blame, not solutions. The Shadow Finance Minister predicted the excuses that will follow as the budget unravels, and whether it's COVID, Canberra or culture, the government has sheeted home the blame for every health failure to everyone but themselves. We hear of our ageing and growing population. Those opposite are happy to identify the problem and attribute blame, but as the government, it is incumbent on them to find a solution. We're not seeing that. Where in this budget is the plan to heal our health system? Where is the plan to fix the Queensland health crisis? Where are the measures which will see a more seamless experience for the patient from primary to acute care? Where in this budget is the desire to catch Queenslanders with minor health problems before they become major ones? Or to share and be open with data to improve patient experience? Mr Speaker, Shadow Minister for Open Data, the member for Budrum, is spearheading our plan to provide open and transparent data to assist healthcare professionals. It can be used as such a powerful tool. With it, the patient and clinicians can make informed decisions about the care they receive and provide. On this side of the House, we've made some responsible and workable suggestions to improve Queensland's public health system, which include making emergency room data available in real time. We know that our hospitals record this information already. It just needs to be released publicly. We've asked the government to improve and better resource triaging practices in our emergency departments and to be honest and open about bed resourcing in our hospitals so that a chair sitting underneath a shower does not count as a bed. This is the only way we will empower those on the front line to make decisions about getting the most out of resources. We want to see our regional and remote, remote hospitals and health centres appropriately resourced and the clinicians in these locations able to work to the full scope of their practice. They shouldn't be hamstrung in looking after their patients. The tyranny of distance, well, it'll always be a challenge in Queensland, and of course there are complex procedures which may require a patient to travel away from home. The, the opposition is realistic about this. But we should look to that as an option of last resort. Let's equip our doctors and nurses in the bush so they can care for patients in their local communities and ease the pressure on the larger hospitals in major centres. Is it the best outcome and smartest use of resources to ask young parents in Chinchilla to have to leave their community to have their baby? The problems which have beset our public hospital system can be fixed, but they won't be if those opposite put their head in the sand and are unwilling to do anything differently. The government can't hide behind the three words record, health, budget any longer. Queenslanders are realising that their health outcomes are being compromised by a mismanaged system, and Queenslanders won't stand for it. Yes, there might be a record health budget, as there is every year. But sitting on those benches opposite is a government whose record on health is now failing honest Queenslanders. For Queenslanders, it's not about 
the government's record health budget. It's about their health record, and on that front they are failing. This budget delivers no solutions to the crime wave ravishing communities across the state. With big increases in crime rates in many local communities, the government is out of ideas. Whether it's the stubbornness of refusing to reinstate breach of bail as an offence, the ham-fisted attempt to hide crime figures, or the failure of ankle bracelets because they are not fit for purpose, it is clear the government is losing control of crime in this state. The disappointing feature of the entire debate is that Labor was never truly committed to combating crime. It was always too hard, or the solutions that worked never met the approval of those elements of the party who see the victim as little more than a nuisance. Sure, the debate moved from Kit Kats to bracelets after the community and a brave commissioner slapped down the minister. But when the crunch came, Labor always uttered platitudes about victims but never took the step to ensure those Queenslanders are safe. Weak laws and poor resources mean officers are being asked to pick up the pieces after criminals have embarked on their lawless outbursts. The need for better facilities has been raised on countless occasions with us. Police in Townsville are going to have to wait at least another 12 months for a new station in Kerwin, with only minor money for planning in this financial year. The irony that this outdated facility was the location for a group of hoons to conduct burnouts in a car park with a stolen vehicle, goading police to chase them, won't be lost on the north. The seemingly intractable problem that is occurring today is that offences are being committed by a cohort of criminals who see crime as a recreational activity. A game. A joke. They refuse to take responsibility for their actions and believe that society should simply carry the burden of their existence. Lines in a budget alone won't fix this. It needs changing laws and the knowledge of those who wear a blue uniform that the government has got their backs. The member for Burdekin, the Shadow Minister for Police and Emergency Services, has campaigned not only in Townsville but from the Gold Coast to the far north for policies that will curb criminal activity. He has highlighted Labor's hands-off approach to criminal activity. He has supported the efforts of the police as they seek to grapple with the elements with one hand tied behind their back. He has led the charge for reforms to the Bail Act to ensure those who breach their bail undertakings can be arrested and charged and, most importantly, separated from the law-abiding citizens they harass and intimidate. Breach of bail legislation is not the cure-all for crime in this state, but it will give the police and the justice system a powerful weapon to protect those who are unable to protect themselves and their property. The stark reality of Labor's failures can be seen in the bungled introduction of GPS tracking devices. They were trumpeted as the solution to the crime problem. It now appears they don't function properly. The technology is not fit for purpose. The budget represents a lost opportunity, an opportunity to chart a new course in an effort to defeat crime, an opportunity to put the interests of citizens first, and an opportunity to support those protecting Queenslanders. In the last six years, the government has failed the first test of government on so many occasions. It has failed the test of community safety. The government went to an election promising to keep Queenslanders safe and strong. It sure doesn't feel that way to Phil from Sunnybank Hills, who was broken into five times. Congestion is another area where Queenslanders have reached out to the opposition with stories that demonstrate a government that is losing control of another basic responsibility. The inability to deliver projects on time and on budget will be an albatross on the growth and prosperity of Queenslanders for a generation. I want to acknowledge the Shadow Transport Minister, a member for Chatsworth, who has been working hard to keep this government honest when it comes to the state's biggest infrastructure project, Cross River Rail. How many times, how many times have we heard those opposite say that it was a $5.4 billion project? While this budget has many flaws, at least it provides a clearer picture on the current cost of Cross River Rail. 
Now Min- hitting Minister for Transport and Main Roads. Now hitting six point nine billion. Oh. And oh. counting. Order. It's not just the project budget that's in trouble. We don't know if they've ordered enough trains. And if those are on order, we'll be ready once the project opens in 2025. That's right, 2025. The, 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 20, the 2024 opening, well, that's another broken promise. That is Labor's infrastructure record. It has uh, been embarrassing. Pause the clock. Pause the clock. Minister for Transport and Main Roads, you're warned under standing orders. Uh, I'm offering the same courtesy to the Leader of the Opposition as was offered to the Treasurer yesterday, uh, on Tuesday, and you're also not putting your comments through the Chair. Leader of the Opposition, you have the call. It has been embarrassing to watch the Treasurer twist himself in knots trying to explain how an infrastructure spend reduction from $56 billion to $52 billion is not a cut. The constant message I get from commuters is that they are sick of spending time behind the wheel of their car instead of spending time with families. People like Brad from the Gold Coast, who commutes daily to Brisbane. Brad tells me the 50-minute trip now runs well past an hour, forcing him to scramble to make arrangements for his kids and forcing him to lose precious time with them. Around the world, we have seen families torn apart by a pandemic. It makes us realise how we must treasure every minute we get to spend with our loved ones. For business, time is money. Any small business owner will tell you that if you're sitting in a traffic jam, you're not making a dollar. Traffic congestion makes it harder to service their customers' needs. It makes it harder to deliver and receive goods. It means phone calls from their employees who are late to work because they too are the victims of a congested network. Ask commuters on the Centenary Highway how they feel about the ever-increasing gridlock and ask what they think of the start of construction of the bridge duplication blowing out from 2021 to 2022. Another broken promise to mums and dads who just want a few extra precious minutes with their kids. That is Labor's infrastructure record. On the Gold Coast, we were told before the election the construction of Stage 3 of light rail was imminent. (laughs) What did we find out after the election? The contract wasn't signed. Mm. And a massive $334 million cost blowout was revealed. A project that was originally meant to be completed in 2023 is now reportedly targeting a late 2024, or maybe 2025 date. Another project, another delay, another cost blowout. That is Labor's infrastructure record. It's worth noting that this project would be in serious strife if it wasn't for the federal government, which agreed to provide additional funding to bail out the state's inability to meet its commitments. On the Sunshine Coast, the Mooloola River interchange is one of those projects that has been on the back burner for too long. This is a state road and responsibility for the upgrade lies with the state government. The local LMP team, both federal and state, knew that continued inaction wasn't good enough and they recently secured $160 million from the federal government for this state project. The state government has had half a decade to do the planning for this vital link. The budget papers reveal just $4 million out of a $320 million project this financial year. Another delay for another vital link. Too many Queensland roads need urgent maintenance. The government was warned by the Auditor-General in 2017 that not enough money was being spent on maintenance and safety was being compromised. Four years later, and we now face a maintenance backlog approaching $6 billion. That is Labor's infrastructure record. As we look towards an Olympic Games in 2032, what do we need? We must spend more on infrastructure for a growing state. We must plan for the population increases that we know are coming and have the roads and the public transport services in place ready for that growth. The government hasn't planned. That is Labor's infrastructure record. 
We have learned that despite a substantial increase in revenue, funding for the infrastructure needed to regain control of the housing crisis will not provide the relief that our state requires. Unbelievably, the Treasurer has announced a $1 billion housing building fund which does not have a single cent allocated in the Fords of this budget. While the Treasurer has made much of the influx of people from interstate, he offers no comfort that the government has any ability to house them without further inflaming the housing shortage. Queensland needs infrastructure built to protect the lifestyles of people who already live here and infrastructure to deliver jobs for those who are moving here. Mr Speaker, Queensland is in the grip of a housing crisis. Years of inaction in providing the needed land supply and supporting road and rail and water and sewerage has led to severe shortage of dwellings for Queenslanders to buy and rent. This government is losing control of the planning needed to accommodate the thousands of people who are moving to Queensland. But this isn't an overnight occurrence. It's been six years in the making. The government's own data shows in the March quarter in 2015, 7,133 lots were approved across Queensland. A year later, that had dropped to 5,285. Then 4,899 in the March quarter, 2017, 3,713 in 2018, 3,038 in 2019, and 2,324 in March 2020. The numbers are starker for the growing southeast corner, where the number of approved lots dropped from 6,177 in the March quarter of 2015 to only 1,699 in 2020. This, despite industry warning, over 30,000 additional dwellings are needed to match our growing population. This lack of supply has been driving up the cost of housing to not just buy but also rent. We've all seen the horror stories of hundreds of people turning up to open homes only for the house to already be sold or rented. Like the constituents who told the member for Kiwana that as a double income family with long term rental history in the local area, they never thought they'd be on the verge of homelessness. And Cassie, who we had here at Parliament, who's had to move cities to put a roof over her kid's head. What does this mean for Queensland? Well, for the first time in living memory, we have a cohort of families with well-paying jobs that cannot find a home. They are the working homeless, and it's got to stop. But it is not just those on solid incomes who are being left behind. The government is also failing those who they claim to most vehemently want to protect, our most vulnerable Queenslanders, the battlers on the breadline. Only last week we heard the Shadow Housing Minister, a member for Everton, talk about the social housing crisis in Cairns whilst on a visit to the region, a crisis brought on by six years of underinvestment in those Queenslanders most in need. This underinvestment in social housing has led to a significant rise in the size of the social housing waiting list, a list that has now more than 26,000 Queenslanders on it. What's more, 16,000 of the applications on this list are from Queenslanders who are classified as very high need. That means 61 per cent of all applicants are in desperation stakes. This has happened because over the past six years, Labor has only increased the number of government-owned housings, dwellings by less than 1 per cent. Let me repeat that, Mr Speaker. Less than a per cent over more than half a decade. That's housing stock for social housing, community housing and Indigenous housing. Now the government want us to praise them for addressing a crisis they've created by establishing a fund they aren't funding. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we've got to do better than this. There are community housing providers who are eager to be involved. Their mission is to ensure honest Queenslanders have a roof over their head and somewhere safe to sleep. The government can partner with them to give people a shot at a stable home. This is bigger than ideology. Those opposite need to put it to one side. It's about providing a home for Queenslanders. It's too important to get it wrong.
We know that a stable, safe home means people are more likely to get a job, more likely to be in better health, and therefore more likely to break a cycle of which they otherwise could be entrenched in for a lifetime. Mr Speaker, this lack of investment in social housing also impacts the ability of many Queensland women who are suffering at the hands of domestic violence to escape that situation. I am determined to lead a centre-right political movement with conviction and compassion. Today I announce the LNP's Social Entrepreneurs Loan Scheme, which will be driven by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Federal Treasurer Frydenberg has committed to an unemployment figure starting with a four in front of it. Part of this strategy is to push the jobless rate lower than historical averages to generate accelerated wages growth. To achieve this outcome, more long-term unemployed Australians will need to rejoin the workforce. ABS data reveals that 34 per cent of unemployed women and 26 per cent of unemployed men are dealing with mental illness. The opposition will advocate to make $20 million available, with loans to be capped at $500,000 per enterprise. The policy proposed would be based on that enacted by David Cameron in the United Kingdom, where a government body provided loans with repayments to commence after two years. The loan appraisals would be assessed by an independent body. The independent body would also provide links to businesses in Queensland that can provide expertise in financial management to allow the businesses to grow. It is also possible that philanthropic sources in the impact investment market could be leveraged to double this fund and support the creation of hundreds of jobs. Jobs for those with a disability. Jobs for those with personal struggles. Jobs for those who too often fall through the cracks. We want to break barriers for those Queenslanders who just want the pride that comes with being able to provide. The Shadow Treasurer will outline the mechanics of this initiative and we hope the government sees it worthy to adopt. If not, I commit the first recipients will benefit from the LNP's Social Entrepreneurs Loan Scheme in 2025. Yeah. There are other failures I will touch briefly on ahead of the contribution to be made by Shadow Ministers and Shadow Assistant Ministers during this debate. Disappointingly, the Treasurer broke his commitment, at least in spirit, to no new taxes when he refused to guarantee advanced waste levy payments to councils beyond the 2021-22 financial year. He will now be forcing councils to be collection officers of a Premier's wheelie bin tax. Shadow Local Government Minister, the member for Warrigo, will, da will detail feedback that she's received from councils throughout Queensland. Needless to say, when ratepayers receive rises in the years ahead to the tune of around 80 bucks, Councils will be in no mood for the recycled excuses that householders won't be impacted. Whilst on environmental initiatives, the only reduction I can see in the $500 million carbon reduction fund is of the financial variety, with not one cent in the forwards. The government has given up on protected areas, with an increase of 0.01 per cent. In his speech, the Shadow Environment Minister will expose how the government has missed every major environmental target it has set itself in office. In the resource space, the Renewable Energy and Hydrogen Jobs Fund has more money not budgeted than it has funded. In agriculture, we again see a reduction in staff, including in the crucial biosecurity space. Research and development is an afterthought for an industry that soldiered on through COVID despite the challenges of staffing shortages. With the prospect of water restriction on the horizon for South East Queensland families, the lack of future planning for water infrastructure has never been starker. As the Shadow Water Minister, the member for Nanango, has revealed, not intent with ripping down Paradise Dam last term, questions remain unanswered over the government's strategy to deliver water security for our growing population while allowing opportunities for farmers in the Lockyer. In my own shadow portfolio responsibility of tourism, we have seen no major financial injection in their hour of need. In the wake of COVID, the state government has provided amongst the lowest amount of industry support per person of any government in the nation. Now is the time to develop new product to ensure the floodgates open when international travel is safe to return. The flagship ecotourism Wongeti Trail project, backed so strongly by the opposition, 
as a new product for our tourism offering is mired in delays. Budget papers show only $430,000 of a $4.52 million budget has been spent in the 2020-21 financial year. The Outback Tourism Infrastructure Fund has spent $1,000 of a $1 million fund. Tourism, events and hospitality are on the cusp of a golden era in this state. In a post-COVID era, our clean and green reputation of the coast and the rainforest, the dreamtime stories of Western Queensland, that sets us apart from our competitors across the globe. Now is the time to provide the confidence for them to invest. When asked about a contingency for another outbreak, the Treasurer's response was, well, heaven forbid there is. Bus business, business isn't looking to the sky. They're looking for certainty. Those in hospitality are looking for the comfort to know if they can't trade for the greater good and lose thousands of dollars in perishables, a safety net is there to assist. Those in events want to bring business to Queensland in the knowledge that if it's cancelled for worthy health reasons beyond their control, a portion of their costs could be met. These initiatives aren't worth tens of millions of dollars. In fact, if we are confident in our health response, they will never be used. But it sends a signal of confidence to the private sector to invest in Queensland. If, as leaders, we can instil confidence in the vaccine rollout amongst our community, the, lockdown, the likelihood of lockdowns will diminish in the months ahead. Mr Speaker, I said from day one I'd be prepared to praise things where they align with the values of our community. And with the federal government embarking on an aggressive free trade strategy, international relationships has never been more important. The increased funding for international education and training strategy is to be applauded. We must be prepared to welcome back students in a safe way in the years ahead. A good education should be the cornerstone of all we do. The government's funding of 10 new schools is welcomed. We intend to work cooperatively to ensure they are delivered by the election and the pipeline to meet growth continues in the decades ahead. Child safety has been an area of great failure for a generation. The increase in funding for child safety officers is positive. Now the minister must lead the cultural change our most vulnerable deserve. In my own electorate of Broadwater, there is money for the Jabiru Island Bridge, the vital link over Coombabar Creek. Residents will be disappointed it's not for the duplication that has been put on the back burner for a generation, but it is attention nonetheless, and I welcome it. Coombabar State High gets nearly 13 million for new classroom facilities. While it technically falls in neighbouring Bonnie, it is a vital facility for my local area. I'll be again campaigning for Coombabar Primary and bigger awarders to be given similar attention to replace dongers that came on the back of a truck decades ago. Can I acknowledge the Minister's good grace in always discussing schooling matters in my local area? Mr Speaker, transparency and accountability matters. There is a reason why I named a Shadow Minister for Integrity. It's because I intend to conduct ourselves in an open manner. The member from Maroochydore will set that standard in government. Those opposite have no such role and have given up on integrity. The abolition of the Productivity Commission has been done for one reason and one reason alone. It shone a light on the fact the government has no vision and no plan to grow the economy through productivity gains. Productivity growth is supported by governments when they provide the necessary infrastructure to help business grow and individuals live their lives more efficiently. It's a tradie being able to quote an extra job instead of being stuck at a level crossing on Barrack Road in Cannon Hill. It's a sugarcane farmer in Morani being able to use new cropping technology made here in Queensland to get better yields on her crops with less water and energy costs. It's a cafe owner in Mitchelton being able to spend more time with his customers rather than filling out forms at a table out the back. And it's about a holiday resort in the Whitsundays being able to have access to a labour pool today that can provide basic services to keep their occupancy rates at a maximum, an IT firm in Longreach having access to government data in real time to drive opportunities for the region, 
or a suburban accounting firm in Cairns being able to find a commerce graduate to head to the far north, find a house to live and help the firm take on more clients. That's what it's about. It's about ensuring our citizen skills are kept up to date so they can pivot to new careers throughout their life. And it's about governments ensuring a supportive culture for emerging industries to provide certainty to venture capitalists that Queensland is a place worth investing in. We know that venture capital from Australian sources is mostly spent either overseas or in southern states. And this shouldn't be the case. It's about providing the infrastructure and services so businesses know that Queensland is a place to expand their business rather than expand it across the border. Up until last month, Queensland had a productivity commission. This independent and free-thinking commission produced landmark reports into electricity prices, service delivery in remote Indigenous communities and improving regulation. In fact, the Commission produced a report that demonstrated that we could improve our gross state product by 1 to 2 per cent by reducing regulatory burden. There are over 265,000 separate regulatory requirements in Queensland. The Commission recommended that our regulation be reviewed and ensure they are fit for purpose. The Commission also produced a report demonstrating how Queensland can build economic resilience into the future and be ready for the next shock when it comes. This Commission was too independent for the Treasurer, so he decided to bury them in Treasury with what is a rather Orwellian title of the Office of Productivity and Red Tape Production, seen for a fleeting media release and then stripped of any independent thought of power. When this government closed the Productivity Commission, they sent a message to Queenslanders the days of openness and transparency are over. This is a government that needs all the help that it can get when it comes to new ideas and vision. They are in their third term. They are becoming smug. They are closed to new ways of thinking and supporting innovation. Much has been made of the Treasurer's definition of frontline services, which sees about 91.5 per cent of public service servants classified as frontline or frontline support. I'll let the Treasurer outline his reasons for this definition. Instead, I'll outline what Queenslanders deserve. Frontline workers with the resources and the trust to serve the public, and those in administrative roles with the respect and the independence to provide the best policy objectives and to allow the private sector to get the most with every dealing with government. In 2024, there will be a Minister for Customer Service, and the member for Chatsworth will ensure each Queenslander is respected and served in the best way in this country. An area of concern for me is the 20 per cent cut to staffing under the Chief Customer and Digital Officer. This is part of a wider drift on digital policy, with most digital projects coming to an end at the end of June. Are we doing enough to guard against cyber attacks on our key government platforms? Are we doing enough to create jobs in the new economy? Mr Speaker, the lack of transparency around the budget process is a great disservice to Queenslanders. The amount of trickery and confusion that surrounds the budget has the effect of leaving Queenslanders in the dark. While the more jaded among us may write this off as political spin, it is in fact nothing short of the disenfranchisement of Queensland people. The attempts by the government to sow confusion range from 22 budget releases late on Friday of the Olympics announcement through to an orchestrated campaign by Labor MPs to prevent scrutiny during the estimates process. We have even seen the Premier hiring, hiding her DG hiring practices on private email. In this budget, we saw several headline programs announced with no funding. The Treasurer sold an asset he already owned to himself at an inflated price to pay down debt. Genius. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, today I unveil my proposal to pull back the covers on budgetary and costing matters and give Queenslanders a clear view. 
to put an end to a secretive process which is designed to confuse and not serve them. I give the commitment today that, if elected, I will establish a parliamentary budget office and start the journey towards transparency. Yeah. Costs to run one vary between jurisdictions in the range of $1.5 to $3.5 million. And as you can see, Mr Speaker, this is a small investment in a large shift in the way we respect our democratic process. The Parliamentary Budget Office will produce an intergenerational report that sets out a long-term strategy for Queensland. It's a vision and a road to get there. It will also put an end to arguments over budget and election costings by offering a policy costing function. Furthermore, it will ensure Queenslanders know the truth at election time by producing a pre-election economic financial outlook to be delivered six weeks before the start of the election period. Yeah. I don't fear having the microscope put over what I say I'll do, when I'll do it and how much it will cost. Does the third term Premier value transparency in the same way she did as when she sat in this chair over half a decade ago? Crucially, the Parliamentary Budget Office will be run independent of government and come under the authority of this parliament. It will be available to all party leaders in this place. The Parliamentary Budget Office and my reforms to the estimate process that I announced last year will bring back trust and dignity to the process and finally allow Queenslanders to know the truth. Yeah. It shouldn't have to wait until 2025. I ask the government to embrace this idea supported by both sides of politics for over a decade and implement it ahead of the 2024 election. To borrow a phrase, it's time. An opposition's role is Order. to hold the government to account. This necessarily involves constructive criticism. I have tempered this with some suggestions for the government on how they could start to address some of the concerns that Queenslanders have outlined to me. I have also set out a blueprint on some accountability measures that will help with transparency around the budget process and lead to better outcomes for honest Queenslanders. Despite the lack of transparency that surrounds this budget, it is clear that it is a deeply flawed document. At the start of my reply, I outlined how a budget should speak to the issues that impact the everyday lives of everyday Queenslanders. This budget fails to deliver on this and, as such, will set Queenslanders back. So I say to Queenslanders, when an ambulance doesn't arrive in Redcliffe because of a failure to address hospital resourcing, think of this budget. When you are stuck in traffic heading to the capital from the Gold or Sunshine Coast because of cuts and delays to road projects, think of this budget. When your car is stolen in Townsville because of a failure to provide police with the tools they need, think of this budget. When a lack of housing options in Aspley means your children can't compete and buy their first home because of the government's failure to keep up with infrastructure, think of this budget. Two days ago, the government had the chance to outline a plan to regain control of health and crime and congestion, productivity and housing. Two days ago, it had a chance to put money in the funds they trumpeted to fix these problems. Two days ago, they had a chance to regain the mantra of transparency they heralded more than half a decade ago. Two days ago, the Treasurer delivered this budget and proclaimed it was a typical Labor budget. Mr Speaker, I agree with him. Yeah. I call the Deputy Premier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Sorry, I just had to wake myself up a little there. Um, I rise to support the Palestine government's uh, budget because it's clear from the rant that we just heard from the Leader of the Opposition that those opposite have no plan for our pandemic recovery and no vision for our great state. Queensland has done remarkably well throughout the pandemic and we are now ahead of the rest of the world in our economic recovery. And the budget data confirms that. 
On almost every indicator we have seen this year, Queensland is outperforming the rest of Australia. More jobs have been created in Queensland than any other state. We have faster dwelling approvals growth than anywhere else in the country, with approvals for construction up 61 per cent since April. We have faster retail growth than the rest of Australia, with retail turnover up 6.2 per cent since the March quarter of 2020. And I have exciting news for the House. Hot off the press, the Treasurer has just handed to me. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has just released the May labour force data, Mr Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it is very exciting indeed. It shows that employment increased by 32,300 people last month. That's more than 1,000 jobs created each and every day. Queensland now has 84,900 more jobs than its pre-COVID level in March last year, the highest in the nation. And and wait for it, Madam Deputy Speaker. The employment, unemployment rate in Queensland posted the largest fall in the nation, falling to 5.4 per cent, now below, now below its pre-COVID level. And, and the Queensland labour market did all of this while the participation rate, the share of people in work or seeking work, increased to 66.6 per cent, almost half a percentage point above the national average. The Palaszczuk government has added 337,400 jobs since we came to office. Our economic recovery plan is working. It is working and it is proven in this data. Our budget continues continues that good work. And I just make this point, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition has questioned the budget projection that we would achieve a 5 per cent unemployment rate over four years. We are now at 5.4 per cent in just one month. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, instead of seeing the incredible opportunities ahead of Queensland, all the Leader of the Opposition could do was talk down our great state. Yes. Whinge, whinge, whinge. Our economy is bouncing back, but he says it's sluggish. We are on track for 5.45 per cent unemployment, but he says he doesn't know what a reasonable unemployment target should be. We are growing at twice the national average, but he spent the whole pandemic criticising our pandemic response that made Queensland the safest state. We are the first large economy to predict a surplus, but he says, well, it's not really clear what he says, because in one breath he says we should be spending more, and in the next we should be cutting spending. That's right, he says we should spend more but borrow less. And, he sa and our world-class health system that kept us safe from COVID and is the envy of the world, he insists, is in crisis. The most important thing from here to get more people into jobs is confidence. And the Leader of the Opposition is doing everything he can to undermine that confidence. I guess we're lucky, Queensland's lucky, nobody knows who he is. Nobody's listening to him. In fact, we learned today that more people know the Premier's cat than know the Leader of the Opposition. Her mother's cat, you're right. The, Mrs Palaszczuk's cat. Mrs Palaszczuk's cat has a higher profile than the Leader of the Opposition. And yesterday, yesterday, the Leader of the Opposition was asked if he would make cuts if he was in office. And he confirmed he would. He said there would be cuts, but he would draw a line. The cuts wouldn't be savage. There's a policy position for you. The LNP will make all the cuts they possibly can right up until just before they become savage. I mean, what kind of cuts does that mean they would make? Harsh cuts? Severe cuts? Devastating cuts? Cruel cuts? Shrinkage cuts? Ruthless cuts? Crippling cuts? Dreadful cuts? Beautiful cuts? Uh, brutal cuts? They are all job cuts, Madam Deputy Speaker. No matter what he says, they would cut them just so long as they weren't savage. 
maybe they'll dust off the old pain threshold ranking that the Newman government's razor gang used. Do you remember that? Their cuts were ranged from one to four based on how painful they'd be. We know they like to cut. That's in their DNA, but so is selling. And you'll have noticed the Leader of the Opposition speech, he criticised our move to ensure that our titles office in Queensland can never be privatised. And the only reason he would criticise that is so that they could privatise it themselves. New South Wales and South Australia both privatised their land titles registries in 2017, Victoria in 2018. We won't do that because we don't privatise things, but also because when New South Wales did it, their new private operator increased some fees by 1,900 per cent. That's what you get when you sell off your titles office. And the Leader of the Opposition, by opposing our steps to keep the titles office in public hands, is keeping his options open to privatise it down the track, to make the same mistake that New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia have made. And we know they wanted to do that last time because it was recommended by the infamous Costello Commission of Audit that recommended the mass privatisation of state-owned assets, including the outsourcing of registry services, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition questioned the independently verified valuation of our titles registry. He just cannot accept that we have the best run, most efficient titles office in the country and that we should keep it in public hands. And then the centrepiece of the member for Broadwater's alternative budget is a new bureaucracy doing the exact same job that we have Queensland Treasury for. It is an insult to the hardworking officers of Queensland Treasury that he would stand in this place and question their independence. That just because he can't understand the budget papers, he insists they must be wrong. That because it doesn't suit his narrative that Queensland is stuffed, he thinks the Treasury must be wrong. It is an extraordinary attack by an opposition on the Treasury itself to say that they can't be trusted to prepare the budget papers. And this is because those opposite only care about themselves and political point scoring. They don't care about Queenslanders. You did not hear a single pledge from them on the things that matter to people. Health, keeping people safe, education, infrastructure the things that improve the lives of people in our state. They are not fit to govern, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as he spoke, you could see those opposite thinking, geez, even the member for Nanango was better than this. Yeah. <laughs> you could see them thinking back there on the, on the back bench, Everton might not have been that good at mathing, but at least he knew how the budget works. The member for Clayfield might have put a for sale sign on everything, but he wouldn't stoop to blaming the Treasury for the bits of the budget he couldn't understand. There's plenty there to ponder for those opposite today. There is no question that the Palaszczuk government is committed to creating jobs for Queenslanders and continuing to deliver Queensland's plan for economic recovery. Our world-class health response has provided us with an opportunity to attract and create jobs, grow our traditional industries and attract new ones. This budget is a great example of how we will capitalise on those opportunities. The $3.34 billion Queensland Jobs Fund is about encouraging investment in Queensland, giving industry the support and confidence they need to establish and grow their businesses here. The fund contains $2 billion dedicated to creating renewable energy and hydrogen jobs. A hydrogen revolution is coming and Queensland is well placed to become a world leader in this new industry. Yeah. This investment will create jobs and support our government-owned businesses to expand ownership of renewable energy and storage to deliver on our 50 per cent renewable energy target by 2030. Yeah. Yeah. It will al also allow us to make more things right here in Queensland. Yeah. We don't just want to invest in renewable energy so we can ship it overseas. We want to capitalise on this cheap, clean energy boon to encourage local large-scale manufacturing. Right now, three quarters of Tesla's lithium, the key ingredient in their lithium-ion batteries, is sourced from Australia, and more, one -third of, more than one third of its nickel. Globally, Australia is supplying 50 per cent of the world's lithium ore at a value of $130 million. 
but we don't supply any of the refined product suitable for battery cells. If we did, the value of that product would be $2.2 billion. Our renewable energy fund will allow us to build up this industry. A new $350 million industry partnership program will provide tailored assistance packages to strengthen local supply chains and grow the footprint of Queensland's industries while creating 2,800 new jobs in industries like advanced manufacturing, hydrogen, biofutures, biomedical defence, aerospace, space, resource recovery and mining equipment, technology and services. It will deliver cross-sectoral opportunities that unlock growth and shore up supply chains. It will allow us to ramp up Australia's capacity to develop our biomedical industry and manufacture uh, and manufacture potentially life-saving vaccines with the development of a new translational manufacturing institute at the existing TRI. This budget also delivers on the next stage of Queensland's economic recovery plan. It includes funding to address land supply challenges. People and businesses are moving to Queensland in droves because they know it's one of the safest places in the world to live, work and raise a family. This budget includes $10.5 million from the Building Acceleration Fund to support the development of trunk infrastructure at the Growth Area Team's first pilot site within the emerging community of Caboolture West. The Building Acceleration Fund is also supporting the construction of new roads, including opening up approximately 1,700 residential lots plus retail development at Bars Scrub and funding to unlock the next stage of Yarra Bilba. There's also $320 million to extend the highly su successful Skilling Queenslanders for Work program, $140 million for the Back to Work program, $330 million for the Great Barrier Reef to support our tourism jobs there. And one of the greatest job creating initiatives of our government, our signature $1 billion Works for Queensland program, sees the 65 councils outside the southeast corner benefiting enormously through building and maintaining community infrastructure. Since its inception, Works for Queensland has created or supported more than 21,600 jobs. And I'm very much looking forward to announcing the projects to be funded in the South East Queensland Community Stimulus Program uh, shortly. Additionally, $41 million has again been committed to assist our Indigenous councils uh, to deliver general and essential public services. Uh, already through this program, over $348 million has, has been approved towards 271 projects. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm proud to say that this is a budget that also delivers on our commitments to the people of Murumba. There's funding for our schools, more money for our hospitals and more support for our community's small businesses. We've seen more money for schools across my electorate, including Dakarman State School, Hercules Road State School, Kalanga State School, Mango Hill State School, Mango Hill State Secondary College, and Underba State School. The satellite hospital in Pine Rivers will continue to move ahead quickly. The Morton Connector, a once-in-a-lifetime infrastructure piece, has also received early funding. Uh, that road will transform our community, connecting Mango Hill and Griffin, massively upgrading Bruce Highway capacity and delivering on and off ramps at Marumba Downs. Uh, this is a budget that delivers on core labour values, delivering on education and on health care. We know that for some communities, health care and social services are difficult to access, particularly for school-aged children. Uh, families in Dacobin reached out to us to get better health services, and I'm proud that the Dacobin Health Hub, located between the Dacobin State High School and Dacobin Primary School, will deliver much-needed health services to those communities. All of these initiatives in my community and right across the state are ensuring improved livability, stronger local economies and more jobs in every Queensland community. This budget allows us to leverage our incredible head start given to us by our health response to build back better and to deliver good, stable jobs and vibrant, thriving communities for all Queenslanders. Uh, before I call the next speaker, I'll just take this opportunity to remind the members in the chamber that are issued with, standing or with a standing warning under the standing orders, the member for Southern Downs, the member for Kukumara, the member for Kabalaba and the member for Miller. I call the minister. Uh, thank you, speaker. I rise on a matter of privilege suddenly arising. The Leader of the Opposition has made claims in his budget reply speech today about the Cross River Rail budget that are misleading. They have been clearly reported in multiple budget papers since 2019, and, I, and Speaker, I will be writing to you about this matter. 
Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Toowoomba South. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this budget sets a record. The record amount of time for a budget to fall apart. The fiscal governance of this state has hit a new low, and that's something I didn't think was possible after the former member for South Brisbane's track record. What we have are funds without funding and accounting without principles. In fact, there are barely any principles in this budget, but I guess that saves the Treasurer the trouble of walking away from them. As anyone who has ever done a budget before knows, you set your fiscal principles and strategy first, and then you build the budget from there. The Treasurer tells us that the principles will be retrofitted in a little while, like changing a fiscal principle to focus on the net debt to revenue ratio rather than a general debt to revenue ratio. I'll give you a stone cold guarantee that any budget delivered by me under a Chris Fully government will have clear and consistent fiscal principles. And if I fail, if I fail at any of them, I will stand before this parliament and explain why they were not hit. Like someone with ticker would do. Through the chair, like, member for Toowoomba South has the call. Like someone with ticker would do. Someone with ticker that wouldn't cherry pick journalist quotes just to feel better about themselves. As Terry McCran really stated, the Queensland budget is bad. The surplus, fantastical. As Mark Ludlow really stated, Dick starts to pay down debt even if it's a sleight of hand. And it seems like it's only something small, but it makes a big difference when you're spinning your budget numbers. The reality is that the Treasurer lives in fear of a credit rating downgrade. Who can forget his mere culpa after the 2012 election? While ministers, including Fraser, Jones, Hinchliffe and former Premier Bly, declined to speak, the Treasurer already had one eye to his political future. He was quoted as saying, I do think Labor fell into the error or seriously miscalculated and underestimated the desire for Queensland to hold on to the AAA credit rating. And I think the concern Queensland had generally about government debt and deficit. The Treasurer's desperation to persuade credit rating agencies that net debt is not all that bad has goaded them into creating assets out of thin air. Their valuation of the titles registry simply does not make sense. How can the state government believe that the titles registry is worth nearly 40 per cent more than the current market capitalisation of the Bank of Queensland? <laughs> the government will misdirect to the precedent of New South Wales, but that precedent involved something entirely different, privatising the operations of their counterpart office, and theirs was valued at $2.6 billion. Labor believe their titles registry, which will not be privatised, at $7.8 billion all up, which is worth more than double those of New South Wales at 2.6, Victoria at $2.8 billion and South Australia at $1.6 billion. I don't know what methodology the government used, but this doesn't look like mark to market, and it sure strains credulity to say it's mark to book. The state's reputation is on the line here. So we continue to ask the Treasurer to release the opaque valuation methodology so that Queenslanders can assess it. If the government has nothing to hide, they have nothing to fear from its release. Now the government has announced that it will retain $1.8 billion from the Titles Registry residual holdings on its books to, presumably, offset borrowings for unfunded initiatives, including the Housing Investment Fund, the Path to Treaty Fund and the Carbon Reduction Investment Fund. Returning to the fantastical proposed surplus in 24-25, it reminds me of one of the Treasurer's good mates. And I'll use his words. Mr Speaker, this is a budget that moves from supporting the economy through the slowdown to bringing us back to surplus now that we are recovering strongly. Who could it be, Madam Deputy Speaker, but Wayne Swan in the 2010-2011 budget speech? And again, this budget delivers a surplus this coming year on time, as promised, and surpluses each year after that, strengthening over time. 
Wayne Swan in the 2011-2012 budget speech. The deficit years of the global recession are behind us. The surplus years are here. Wayne Swan, 2012-2013 budget speech. Madam Deputy Speaker, those words say it all. Here are the facts. The Palaszczuk government had already blown the budget before COVID. Debt had blown out from $72 billion to $102 billion before the pandemic was ever heard of. There had been nine new taxes. We were anchored near or at the foot of ComSec's report on most measures. That is still the case today, no matter who or what the government chooses choose to blame. COVID, Canberra, canines, councils, commercial and confidence, culture, cross-border migration or Queenslanders, as the member for Kiwanis blame wheel highlighted, Madam Deputy Speaker. We are on a three-year streak. We are on a three-year streak of the most bankruptcies in the country. And this budget merely embeds our underperformance. There's a $4 billion cut from the infrastructure spend when we already spend the least in the country as a percentage of our total budget. In contrast, New South Wales and Victoria are spending up to 25 per cent of their total budgets on infrastructure across the Fords. Worryingly, we are ever more reliant on federal expenditure to help Labor prop up the mismanagement of our economy. As the, as the member for Broadwater and our leader has already spoken about, the government's agenda of microeconomic reform is non-existent. In fact, it's laughable. The government clearly don't intend to do anything real. The business launch pad cuts no regulation and simply give, gives businesses a single portal into a sprawl of regulation. The Treasurer has replaced the independent Queensland Pro Productivity Commission with the government-controlled and Orwellianly named Office of Productivity and Red Tape Reduction. It was abolished for the simple reason of asking too many questions of the government and delivering too many ideas to them that they did not like. The problem with the fear of ideas and no reform agenda is that there is nothing to drive private business investment. There has been an alarming decline in Queensland private business investment, the driver of sustainable long-term growth in Queensland's future. It's declining in competitiveness as a share of the Queensland economy and in absolute terms. During the Bly and Palaszczuk eras, Queensland's competitiveness attract, attraction, uh, private business investment, has declined by almost a quarter, causing the business investment share of the economy to collapse by over a third. Even Victoria, the land of the lockdown, is outperforming Queensland in private business investment. Giant. Queensland private business investment is declining at more than 12.5 per cent on an annualised basis. Now, budget papers reveal the heroic assumption that overall business investment is expected to grow by 4 per cent in 21-22, after three years of consecutive decline. More specifically, the budget papers predict a 4 per cent increase, followed by a further 7.5 per cent growth annually in business investment. But what is the Treasurer basing this heroic assumption on? A sentiment survey, feelings, and an assumption of no natural disasters, no interest rate rises, and no capacity constraints. Madam Deputy Speaker, Deloitte Access Economics has warned that trench and unemployment will be Queensland's continuing Achilles heel. It's a fact that Queensland's current reversal in employment fortunes is heavily skewed towards part-time, casual and temporary jobs created by the consumption and housing boom we're seeing. Federal Treasurer Frydenberg has talked about an unemployment rate with a four in front of it. That means that every employment opportunity must be available to every Queenslander to find work. That is why today I want to discuss an area of policy that is particularly close to my heart. The growing social enterprise sector focuses on improving the employment prospects for those furthest from the workforce. The success rate of social enterprise workers is undeniable. 
80 per cent employment after 12 months, compared with 35 per cent for government programs for disability employment services. As a founding director of Vanguard Laundry in Toowoomba, I saw up close the power of giving people with the lived experience of mental illness a job and an employment pathway. These were men and women who had struggled to find secure employment, some for a decade or more. Broader research by Swinburne University found that after one year of Vanguard's operation, workers were much less likely to rely on welfare. A quarter had stopped receiving Centrelink payments altogether. They were less likely to present at the Toowoomba Hospital. Smoking rates had dropped. Wellness had improved. They simply felt better. Creating employment opportunities also forms a vital part of an inclusive and empowering community for people living with a disability. 70 per cent of refugees struggle to find a job in their first year of living in Australia. 70 per cent of ex-criminal offenders will never find work. We can do more to support job opportunities for young people at risk to minimise contact with state services like youth justice, mental health and community development programs. That is why the Leader and I are announcing today that a future LNP government will introduce the largest social enterprise scheme in Queensland's history. The LNP Social Entrepreneurs Scheme will invest $20 million every year to empower social enterprises to change the lives of Queenslanders who need it most. Loans will be capped at $500,000 and required to meet certain conditions to access the scheme. The interest-free loans will offer catalytic capital to Queensland's brightest and most innovative social entrepreneurs and it will be supported and administered by QIT, a QIC. Currently in Queensland, there is no large-scale jobs-focused loan funds that have helped prove social, help proven social entrepreneurs scale and grow into new markets and opportunities. From Cooktown to Coolangatta, there are opportunities right now that could be scaled to move our unemployment numbers to where they need to be. I want the Queensland economy to work for everyone. Jo jobs policy with heart and capitalism with a conscience. This kind of investment from government could also activate philanthropic sources and the impact investment market could be leveraged to expand our scheme and, as the leaders have said, create hundreds of further new jobs. And In fact, I believe the policy can create thousands of new jobs. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, what does this budget tell us about this government? It proves that this government knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. That Labor's marketing becomes slicker in direct proportion to the mismanagement they need to cover up. That the government might announce a record health spend, but they don't understand the value of our frontline workers dealing every day with ambulance ramping waiting lists and system pressures, that the government has tried nothing and yet they are still out of ideas, that they don't understand the value that businesses play in a functioning society and that they see nothing deceptive about renaming old government programs and claiming them as new money. It's also time, Madam Deputy Speaker, for accountability and integrity in our public finances. That is what a parliamentary budget office will deliver, and we will deliver it in government. A parliamentary budget office will restore trust, and Queenslanders will never have to doubt the integrity of the public finances prior to an election again. We should never see circumstances where a $4 billion debt commitment at an election becomes $28 billion merely a few weeks afterwards. Madam Deputy Speaker, honest Queenslanders deserve better than yet another term of Labor budgets full of funds without funding and accounting without principles. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is time for this government to become serious about our budget and back the Queensland public who work hard 
and sacrifice plenty of their paycheck to fund this government's Deputy operations. Speaker. I call the member for McConnell. Um, it's interesting when you hear the reply speeches, and we've just heard from the presumably shadow treasurer who wants to be treasurer of this state. And when you talk about substance, I mean, this is from the LNP that all week, all we've seen is gimmicks, cliches, and one liners, and nothing, and I mean nothing, of substance. Absolutely nothing. We are in the middle of a world health pandemic. New South Wales has just been declared in some areas, Deputy Speaker, a hotspot because there's an outbreak and Victoria's just coming off theirs. We are not out of the woods yet. However, our economic recovery sees the state, Queensland, leading the nation for jobs and growth, and yet nothing from those opposite but whinge, whinge, whinge. The budget strengthens the core pillars of the Palaszczuk Labor government, health care, education, infrastructure, renewables and jobs, jobs, jobs. And what a beautiful set of figures have just come off the labour force statistics here in Queensland. And I think they're worth even repeating, because you can have all the social justice funds in the world. You can have the best type of funds out there. The best one that you can have is a fund that delivers in jobs. And where are we now? 5.4 per cent, leading the nation on every economic indicator. That is the reality. Those opposite can talk about anything they want, and the figures do not spell what they are saying. And these latest figures demonstrate that. Our participation rate going up, and yet our unemployment rate going down. That is an incredible feat in the middle of a world health pandemic, Deputy Speaker. An absolute... And here we've got the deniers over there. Soon as you mentioned COVID, soon as you mentioned world health pandemic, we, had, we have them over there denying they're under a rock, they don't, it's a conspiracy, it's not happening. But as we know, there is nothing that those opposite can get right, not even the vaccination of Australians can the federal government roll out and get that right. They can't get it right on international borders. They, they, they make a billowheeler family suffer, but at the same time, they can't do anything when it comes to quarantining in the state. They wash their hands. If it wasn't for the states, we would be in dire strait in this country. Let nobody dispute that. When it comes to the jobs that this government has created, let's say it again, Deputy Speaker. 337,400 since we came to office and we've recruited all of those jobs and we're ahead by 84,000. An extraordinary feat and we know that we have employers still calling for more jobs and we have an excellent Minister for Small Business that is working with them to ensure that we've got the skills and that we have got the training there that can meet those demands. And when we talk about infrastructure, I wish that they could just read budget papers because we started with there's cuts in infrastructure spending. Then we went to reduction in infrastructure spending. Then the last time they got up, they talked about shrinkage in infrastructure spending. But what we know, and what we know on this side of the House, is the people of Queensland had a choice in October. Keeping Queenslanders safe, endorsing our economic recovery plan, endorsing our jobs plan, making sure we had the health out there to support a world health pandemic, and they elected us in spades. And here we are again on this side of the House for four more years. But why wouldn't you? When you were listening to those opposite, not one new idea, not one solution, and nothing, as I said before, but whinge, whinge, whinge. And it was interesting because I said to my staff downstairs, I said, when the opposition leader's budget reply makes his speech, can you sit by and just let me know if there's anything in the education budget that I can refer to in my reply speech. 
And my staff were there waiting, and they were waiting, and they were waiting again. But unfortunately, not one alternate education policy. It didn't take them long to find out that there were no plans for education in the state. One of the important fundamental core skills we want to get our young people in this state, not one mention. And it's interesting that in this whole budget week so far, and I know there's still a short um, question time tomorrow, I haven't got one question on education, one of the most important pillars of our budget this time round. And it's an absolute disgrace when you consider that they talk about health and yet, again, nothing in the speech about how they prepare or they hope to um, fix all of these um, whinging kind of malaise that they keep talking about. And um, perhaps those opposite should spend less time whinging, less time spinning wheels, um, less time opening stupid cupboards, Order and members. More time developing policy alternatives. Because when it comes to principles, I agree with some of the interjections when the, um, when the shadow um, treasurer talked about principles. What are their principles when it comes to cutting? What are their principles when it comes to sacking? And what are their principles when it comes to selling? And we know what they are. There was a bit of a hint, only if they're not savage. They can't reach the savage point on the indicator, whatever that means. And as the Deputy Premier went through you know, a number of alternatives about what savage means, we know one thing, the Queensland people aren't going to give them any chance to be savaged again. And um, that reply speech was exactly that. The only idea the LNP has is this loans to social enterprises. Unfortunately, we beat them in the last budget. We actually have a social enterprise jobs fund. Oops, they didn't realise we actually have one already. And, um, and when it comes to giving those in the social sector jobs, they were the ones opposite Deputy um, Speaker who cut the Skilling Queenslanders for work. Now, if there is one group that benefits from skilling Queenslanders for work, it's those in the social enterprise areas. And we have now locked in $320 million over four years and permanent funding for a program that delivers in spades for those unemployed people with the skills that they need to get jobs. And I actually had texts from people in the social sector saying, thank you so much for locking in that funding our jobs of our participants is at 90 per cent. 90 per cent of the participants in Skilling Queenslanders for Work got jobs in that particular social enterprise. And um, so we've got this new idea that we announced in the last budget. And the LNP, of course, has a shocking record when it comes to the community sector. Can you imagine them for one second trusting those opposite. They axed $368 million in community grants to support the Queenslanders in need of assistance. That's what they did when they were in government, and the community sector won't forget it. And the worst of all was they gagged the community groups from speaking up on behalf of the people that they represent. Now, if there's something more than shocking in a free world is when you gag a whole sector from speaking up and you threaten their livelihood. They were gagged because if they spoke up, they would take away their funding. And they now expect this sector to trust them with their one idea that came out of the reply speech. It's a joke. They are a joke, and that's why they're over there. And it's interesting to know what strings will be attached to these loans. You can't say anything. Never complain. We'll gag you again. We'll give you the money, Deputy Speaker, but don't you dare come out and represent your constituents because we'll gag you. We're going to use this money. And you bet your bottom dollar that's exactly what they will do. Will these social enterprises, like I said, just have to shut up and put up while the LNP cuts programs like skilling Queenslanders for work again? That is what they are looking um, forward to in relation to their idea, an idea that we announced in the last budget. 
That's a great idea. I'm the only one that came out of this. Can I also just say, when it comes to the education budget, it is an honour to be the Minister for Education in this state. And, um, and the Leader of the Opposition was right. I do listen to everyone in this House when it comes to their needs. Um, we don't pay politics with it. And we know that when it comes to meeting growth, when it comes to meeting the schooling of our students, I put that first than any other consideration. And I was very grateful that the um, Leader of the Opposition um, did acknowledge that, and I know that there are um, you know, an amount of infrastructure that is spread right across and we are meeting where the demands are, and there's no doubt about that. And it is, and it is an honour to work with everyone in this House to deliver that, because education is a core in this state, and I look forward to working with every to deliver the infrastructure that we need, the teachers that we need, the teacher aides, the cleaners who have done an outstanding job during COVID, and to implement our record $15.3 billion budget. We want to deliver the 10 schools in those fast-growing areas. We want to deliver the new classrooms that we need to, and as I mentioned, and I've mentioned all week, in various areas of the state, no one is missing out. There is an incredible amount, the regions, um, everywhere throughout the state. I look forward to delivering the local jobs and, of course, all those local facilities and amenities. Um, maintenance, renewal, we're having an outside school hours care expansion in sites around 50 schools so that we know balancing school and um, vacation care and the like is important and we're working um, with schools like those in Ipswich, Victoria Point State School in Redlands, Ormiston State School in Ujuru and others right around um, the state. Halls, um, you know, I can't believe I'm still building halls, but I am. And there's money there for halls right across our air conditioning program, fully funded, incredible, on track, air conditioning every classroom, every staff room and every library library and an incredible job in rolling that out. New South Wales is now coming to us saying, please tell us how you're doing it, because we can't deliver it. What are you doing? How are you doing it? Because in New South Wales are so far behind, it isn't funny. And they're now coming here asking us what we are doing and how we're doing it. We got our ACES program. We got local schools and local jobs. We have um, a school um, employment. We've got our election commitments that we're rolling out. It is an honour to be delivering this budget, an education budget, a health budget in a world class in a world health pandemic. Industrial relations is being funded for our signature new laws when it comes to labour hire licensing, one of the most successful laws in the nation. And when it comes to wage theft laws, and we've got extra inspectors to make sure that we work um, across the nation to ensure that workers are not exploited in this area. Racing can look forward to an additional 41.3 million at least in now 35 per cent of the point of consumption tax. And I know the Mermaid, member for Mermaid Beach would be member for Mermaid would be very happy in relation to that. He loves his racing, and I actually like going to the races with him as well. In the electorate of McConnell, the highlights are $15 million for Brisbane Central classrooms in a growth area, Fortitude Valley at second stage, and of course $11 million for New Farm State School out of 20.6 that will continue to build the classrooms, $15 million allocated for Ballymore redevelopment. That is going to be fantastic. That will see Ballymore reshaped into a national rugby training centre, which will be the new headquarters for the Wallaroos, Queensland Reds men and the women's squad. And Newstead House, one of the oldest surviving European homes in Brisbane, is gearing for a nearly $4 million major restoration and refurbishment to ensure the future of this beautiful and iconic landmark um, is maintained. Um, Deputy Speaker, I could go on, but one of the most significant things I'm very happy about is a $7 million support to the live music industry. They have been hard hit by COVID. There is no doubt about it. And I want to roll that out as we've rolled out funds already um, for the live music, $1.3 million. I visited some live music spots. I was at the Tivoli last week. I went to the Woolly Mammoth um, not too long ago, and I was always at Triffid um, um, at the same time. And we want to make sure that they survive this COVID because it's real, because it's impacting and because this government recognises it and is doing something about it. Can I say that um, this budget is an honour? Can I endorse it? 
can I congratulate the Treasurer and my colleagues. Under the Premier's leadership, we kept this state safe. We can now implement our economic plan, create the jobs that Queenslanders deserve. Madam Deputy Speaker. I call the member for Kwana. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> on Monday I launched the Labor's blame game spinning wheel because we knew and anticipated this week Labor would blame everyone but themselves. They'd blame someone else on the debt, they'd blame it on education, health, it's everyone else's fault. So we had you know, we had Canberra, we had COVID, that was on the wheel a couple of times. I had to adjust I had to adjust the wheel in the last couple of weeks. Never would I have thought I would have had to add the word canine because the reason the Premier didn't get a COVID jab because of COVID he he hesitancy was because she got attacked by Winton, a fluffy little pooch. So I added canines as well because that was the excuse for the Premier delaying her COVID jab despite the fact she told everyone else to get their COVID jab. So we did that and just as I anticipated, the Treasurer stood up this week. He blamed everyone for all the, the debt, the blowouts, uh, the reason the budget's full of holes, and it is full of holes, which we'll get into, and as was set out by the Opposition Leader and the Shadow Treasurer. We also launched yesterday the cupboard. The cupboard's bare, because that's what the budget is. These ministers got up on uh, Tuesday when the budget was delivered. The Treasurer released all these glossy brochures, but then our Shadow Ministers, after going through the budget, and then the media going through the budget, realised that a lot of these funds actually had no funding. So lots of names, lots of uh, titles, like the Building Hospital Fund, $2 billion, but not a cent going to the Building Hospital Fund, not an additional dollar. So it's basically just packaging up a lot of things in the budget and just putting a new headline under it saying it's a new budget. And then, and then they, on Tuesday they announced we're investing a new $2 billion into the Hospital Building Fund. There's not a dollar, zero dollars in the hospital building fund. It's not going to build new hospitals. It's not going to build new infrastructure to existing hospitals. It's not going to fix the Sunshine Coast University Hospital ramping that we're experiencing at the moment. So, but of course, what we've got to know with this treasurer, and it's not just when he's been treasurer, but in all his portfolios, attorney general and education minister and health minister, he's all glitz and glamour and no substance. That is what Treasurer Dick is. And we saw it with all all the glossy brochures he puts up as far as he can. He's, you know, uh, economic recovery. <laughs> he, he has that. And then I, I think what I really, what's missing from this budget is the amount the treasurer has spent on PR, personal PR, because he's been told by someone, and it's, it, it, I'm going to tell him just to stop getting the advice, whoever he's paying this advice to. He's doing this weird, creepy, fakey smile that he's trying to be loved by everyone in Queensland. So much so that at his live crosses the other night, and I've got to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, this creepy smile that he's been told by the PR company to, to do, it'll make you look It'll make you look human. It doesn't, please. It has the opposite effect every time I see it on TV. It's sort of mixed between... It's between... It's, be, it's between the clowns you see at Ecker that just keep going around with their mouth open and Chucky Doll. It's sort of this creepy, weird Chucky Doll clown, Ecker clown. So I just say to the Treasurer, mate, whatever you're spending on the PR to make yourself look human, just stop it. Just be natural. Just get rid of it. Because even the other night on Channel, I think it was Channel 7, his live cross, he'd even practiced the big turn with the big creepy smile. The camera, the camera had already lost him by that stage and he didn't get his weird creepy smile on TV. So just cut it out, Treasurer. It's, it's, it's not good and it doesn't look good on TV. So see, we see the budget being handed out by the Treasurer full of holes. Uh, they, they all stood up here with this capital budget expenditure. But as shadow ministers will indicate during this budget uh, reply, there are just line items missing, funding missing, and that's what we've got to know the, this, uh, this Treasurer. I notice in the Treasurer's response and the ministers that have just responded, and including the Deputy Premier, no one has mentioned JobKeeper propping up the economy. $90 billion the federal government threw into JobKeeper. That's on top of the over $60 billion job seeker. Not rating a mention in anything. He gets up and claims the unemployment rate. <laughs> He claims the unemployment rates come down because of their policies. What? Because of a little tourism voucher? The voucher that the Deputy Premier couldn't even take because they weren't offering it in Byron Bay? This is the reality. Job keeper, job seeker propped up the economy in the state. And when you look at the statistics, if you look at the statistics of what the federal government did 
per person in Queensland compared to what the state government did, it highlights a shameful exercise in government expenditure. The state government did nothing in comparison to what the federal government did. They will claim credit now for the Australian economy rebounding, but it was because of the federal leadership of the Scott Morrison government that we now see the federal economy rebounding, including that of Queenslanders. Not to mention not to mention the effort that Queensland has put in to us this as well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. If I look at, um, if I look at the issues in Kiwana on, on the Sunshine Coast, I see they've got the stadium in there, $20 million, which was my funding commitment in the election, so that, that was good they, uh, they copied it. But now I see they put a little sneaky subject to federal government matching it. Well, if the federal government are not going to fund the $20 million yet, just give the $20 million to the council. They'll add it on top of the private sector investment, add it on top of what the council is, and we're going to have a better stadium than what's there now. So I call on the government, scrap the little condition now, because I know this is, this is so the state government can get out of that commitment. This is so the state government can get out of that commitment. We now see the Malula River interchange. They have finally found the Malula River interchange. Despite the fact the federal government, the federal government, I take the interjection from the Minister for Transport. And Madam Deputy, I take the, I take the second interjection. Madam Deputy Speaker, if I can take a point of order on myself, uh, I've taken the interjections from the Minister, who is on a warning, and he is disrupting my speech, and I ask to be uh, kicked out of the Parliament because he is on a warning. Uh, member for Kwana, take your seat. Thank you for your guidance. Uh, the Member for Miller is on a warning. Your interjection has been taken. Or you can leave the chamber for the rest of the session. You get an early mark for lunch. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I didn't interject, uh, Speaker. You did. I, don't I took anything. your interjection. Uh, sit, sit down, the member for Kwana. Member for Miller, I have made a ruling. Are you reflecting on the chair or are you raising a point of order? I'm just, I'm just raising a point of order. Uh, Is speaker. your point of order? I don't believe that I uh, interjected on the, the member. I... Point of order, Madam Speaker. When a member of this House happy has to been take asked your, to leave to the take chamber, him taking a point of order to... is a reflection on the chair. I have made a ruling, Member for Miller. You will leave the chamber for the duration of the morning session. Madam Deputy Member Speaker. for Kiwana has the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. That's exciting in budget reply, isn't it? It's the <laughs> best thing I could have achieved in a budget reply speech. Madam Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, so if we keep talking about uh, Kiwana and the lack of investment, they finally found the Malula River interchange. $160 million the federal government will be putting into it, and now the state government have come to the party, and without any fanfare, I might add. They're, not, they're so embarrassed by it. They're no fanfare. They're putting $4 million in the budget. They should be embarrassed. They take the interjection. $4 million in the budget. Just get on with the program. You've been embarrassed in coming to the table, and now, because the feds have embarrassed them, their feds are delivering now what will be it's still a state road but the feds have come to the party when the state should have done it there's more money to the sunshine coast university hospital now this is about built bed capacity no additional beds into the sunshine coast university hospital the hospital was meant to have 738 beds by 2021 by january 2021 and where are we we still have not had any additional beds since the hospital opened madam deputy speaker so again now the government is saying okay we'll throw a bit of money into the hospital that's to build a building without beds. There's no extra funding for extra beds at the Sunshine Coast University Hospital. So our 40% ambulance ramping crisis, which is happening at the hospital, will continue and the people on the Sunshine Coast will suffer because of that. Can I also address the issue of this mass transit, uh, uh, mass transit uh, personal program that Mayor Jemison's trying to uh, inflict on everyone on the Sunshine Coast? M Madam Deputy Speaker, can I just say to the State Government and the Sunshine Coast Council, Abandon the glorified light rail tram down Nicollum Way. Protect our beachside communities. Protect the environment on the Sunshine Coast. We do not want the mass transit tram down Nicollum Way. We want to protect the lifestyles of the Sunshine Coast community. And when Mayor Jemison says to me, well, what's the alternative? There is an alternative, and here it is. One, 
Build the Mooloola River interchange to ease congestion. Tick, we'll do that. Second, build the passenger heavy rail on the Cancos corridor. The corridor is there. It is set. The state government can invest and get heavy passenger rail to connect the Sunshine Coast community to Brisbane, to Gympie. It's ready. So invest in the Cancos corridor. Bring the heavy rail from Biwa to Caloundra to Kiwana to Maroochydore. Then, thirdly, Here's an idea. How about we provide buses that go to where people want them to go, Madam Deputy Speaker, like Kiwana Forest. Kiwana Forest don't have any bus services. They want it, they demand it, and we need to have it. Let's make buses more available. Let's do more buses so we don't have to wait. Someone goes from Kiwana to Budrum, takes an hour and a half. They can get in their car and they can do it in 10 minutes. Why on earth would they catch a bus at the moment on the Sunshine Coast when they can do it in their car in, in, in a lot less of the time? That is the issue. So if Mayor Jemison, who's still pushing this light rail fantasy on the Sunshine Coast community, there are alternatives and they are far better than a glorified tram down wrecking our beachside communities. We need to protect the environment. We need to protect the lifestyle and livelihoods of the Sunshine Coast community. And where they want the density, and it, uh, we don't want the density down the Nicollum Way or the beachside communities, we will have the density on the Sunshine Coast, but there are better places to put more density and more people. Let's have new railway communities on the Sunshine Coast. Let's build them from scratch, new railways communities. People love the Sunshine Coast. We want people to move to the Sunshine Coast, Madam Deputy Speaker. In terms of the uh, industrial relations portfolio I'm Shadow Minister for, I met yesterday with another business in Queensland that are being attacked daily by the thugs in the CFMEU. Three times a day the CFMEU are turning up at this business because they are a non-unionised worksite and the CFMEU is trying to bully them and force them to do an EBA. And this business, to their credit, has said no, get stuff. That's what they've said to the CFMEU. I withdraw. Point of order. That's what they've, Point said, of order. To the, that's what they've said to the CI. Point of order. The CFMEU sympathiser there, waving his hands up. Yeah. Member of the CFMEU. They say to the CFMEU, get lost. They're not going to sign the EBA. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is the reality. Point of these order. Companies, Point of order, Deputy Speaker. Pause the clock. Point of order. That was unparliamentary language. I ask you to sit down. He withdrew. Madam and Deputy Speaker. Paul, at at 1pm the House will adjourn for lunch. Our Thank you. member for Kiwana has the call for a few more seconds. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, the CFMEU are trying to strong arm and bully businesses to sign EBAs. I'm going to refer this matter, as I have with others, to the Crime and Corruption Commission. It is about time the Crime and Corruption Commission have a commission of inquiry into the CFMEU and their bullying tactics. Madam Deputy Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. As it is now 1pm, the House will now break for lunch and return at 2pm.